point, we'd like you to step on up and ask away. And if you don't mind stepping up to the microphone and just giving us your name, that would be great. Just lean into the microphone a little bit so that uh, everybody can hear you. And we're all being streamed tonight, so you're on camera. Appreciate it. That's true. Anybody else want to come up and share some any any questions, concerns? And we can we can uh, the school board you know can uh, jump in and, and uh, address any pieces of information that they feel might be relevant or helpful. If there's anything anybody came for specifically tonight to learn more about, um, I know a number of you have been with us along this journey this fall with unpacking a lot of the aspects of. Um, our facilities. Um, some of you have been with us for a lot longer than that, even going back to the um, the original charge and the original project that um, that was worked on. So um, this is the opportunity to sort of have that conversation um, with us and um, be able to um, get some information from any of us or um, ask for clarification on various aspects of it, especially those of you who've been along. I've been attending meetings quite regularly, so. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I think the mic is on. Is the light on, Diane? Uh, no. Yeah, it's on. Yeah, it's okay. Just the yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. Thank you. I'll go testing one, two. Yeah. Testing one, two. Is that better? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the uh, budget committee and the school board are having long conversations since. Uh, April or May, um, and I just want the opportunity to speak to the, the board already knows, but anybody else who's here about a programmatic budget, and it would be nice to hear where the board's at on that um, tonight, now, or at the school board meeting, but, um, you know, we're concerned about the deferred maintenance and uh, the costs and the revenues, and the programmatic budget is one way for the community to have a conversation and to understand year to year where things are going into programs versus maintenance versus buildings, whatnot. It's a very clear way to have a conversation so that we can all um, participate and maybe come up with ideas. Uh, so I'd just like maybe the board to talk a little bit about where it stands um, with the programmatic budget because there'll be an opportunity for the public to go to the budget committee meetings in January and listen and offer comments as that process unfolds. Thanks. Sure. Um, uh, Jim, and you, we want to speak to it. Jim, too, you've been, Jim yeah, is our representative start? on the budget committee. You can jump in. Go ahead. Um, so as no, Diane please. knows, um, there has been a conversation with the, with the school board and me as a representative on the budget committee, and the budget committee around a programmatic budget. And so we presented a couple of months ago um, and worked with the budget committee on sort of a, a format in which to present um, our budget a little bit differently and, and maybe a bit more of an understandable way um, and I think over the past couple of budget committee meetings, we've gotten, um, I think we've moved the process a little bit forward, maybe not as fast as um, the budget committee um, would like to see. And then I think at our last meeting, uh, the budget committee went over the newest proposal from the school board um, and the budget committee as a whole made recommendations through a motion and a vote for some changes they'd like to see to the format that, um, that we've sent in. Um, and then I think Liz got attacked by a shark. No, mm -hmm. Liz yeah. <laughs> hurt herself this week, so we yeah. haven't had a chance, I think, to catch up um, and, and really to go over those changes and how we would address them. But I think um, between now and the next uh, budget committee meeting, which I know is in early January, um, the school board should have a response to each of those ideas that the budget committee brought forward and see how we could reach resolution on them. Um, 
I think that's where we're yeah, at. Yeah, and that's really um, what's transpired since last last Thursday's um, last Thursday's meeting. Um, one of the things with the listening post that the board really values is the opportunity for the community to be able to come and to participate in a little less than a uh, than a business meeting. And what the board's going to need to do in the next couple of weeks is really decide. Um, what they, if anything, want to move forward in terms of a facilities um, project. We've been unpacking aspects of the facilities project um, all fall um, based on a revised charge that was given to the steering committee back in the, um, after the March meeting. And so one of the things that we felt was important for this time tonight was for the board to hear um, comments and, and input um, for that the school board can take into consideration um, from the community and I think that's something that the board really um, is earnest about wants to hear what the community's feelings are that's why inviting you all to come a little bit earlier and also inviting email um, and certainly the opportunity to respond even after this listening post to um, to myself to my email um, will be helpful because when the board starts the discussions in the next week or so about um, where we are and what we feel, if anything, we want to move forward. It's really important for us to have as much input and feedback as possible. We've been very fortunate. We've received a lot of feedback throughout the fall, but, um, but again, that's a, a relatively um, small slice of the entire community. Um, so I really encourage you also, um, as you speak with friends, family, um, and anybody else, to encourage them to uh, get more information, go into our um, into the website and either listen to the recordings of the meetings or watch the video recordings of the meetings. They've all been uh, streamed and, and archived since um, July when we met over at Town Hall. Um, so they're all online. So if you missed it, there's anything in particular that you're interested in and if you have any questions um, and want to provide some feedback. So any other board members want to provide any more input to those that are here tonight or listening or watching online? I'll just add, um, I was not here for a few meetings due to personal and business reasons and travel, uh, but I utilized our videos to keep myself caught up while we were gone, and I highly encourage folks to sit down and take the time and watch them if they miss the information. A lot of the questions that we get, a lot of that information's been covered. They're in the videos. They'll give you a whole broad scope of what's been discussed. Um, and it'll make you much more informed so you can come to your own decisions. So they're there. They're great recordings that you can hear. Um, so Matt done a great job setting that up for us. So thank you. Uh, certainly made my life a lot easier. And I know a lot of folks can't come out. It's a hard time, but the information's there and you can listen to it at your leisure. Yeah, so I guess, I mean, I would just, what I'm most interested in hearing, I guess, from the public is, you know, we've been presented a different options for how we can move forward with the project uh, and I boiled down we have sort of two options for facility improvement for lack of a better term I think one would be building on to Harold Martin School and then the other one is to um, move sixth grade to the middle high school and do um, larger improvements over there so I'm just I guess if I look at what we have in front of us is sort of two divergent proposals with two divergent costs I'm curious to see what the community what you all feel about those two um, so those two places and we can we can then separate as we think about those two into different buckets but um, fundamentally I think those are our two choices at the moment that's been presented to me as a board member um, so I'm just curious of what the community thinks about um, which direction I mean those are pretty big directions but which direction um, you know the community thinks that we should be thinking about this project in that would be helpful to me anyway Amy Clay. My last question at the end of the uh, meeting last weekend was, uh, last week was, um, the growth of the preschool and the kindergarten is actually making us have to shift classes upward, and making for the additional growth that we need. Has anyone looked at the cost of making a location for the preschool and kindergarten that would be much less expensive than adding on to a grade school or a high school setting because they don't have as many requirements as the, as the educational grades would. Um, I just like that considered. I mean, the 50-50 for the preschool 
having to match the um, needed students with paid students. And then the, we had the kindergarten move in or asked for that kindergarten because we had so much state funding, and now we don't. So we've got huge kindergartens, huge preschools, and now we have to make room for those extra classes that are moving up. I want to know if that's been taken into consideration. Well, we've, we've looked at uh, possibly uh, to relieve some of the pressure to uh, relocating um, preschool to another site, but more as a temporary. Uh, we have not looked at um, separating out a, a kindergarten program away from the school. Uh, we've spent so much time and energy looking at security and how we plan and integrate and provide services. Um, but that's something we can look at. But no, I can't say that, that Bill and I have spent a lot of time for a permanent different structure of kindergarten. We have, I think there is some history about some preschools and other locations in town, but we haven't said how can we make 900 square feet and what kind of state requirements are for a classroom and can we actually repl replicate that for less than the $3.2 million that we have right now for building four classrooms. So safety, meet state requirements, um, but no, we haven't spent too much time. Dave, do you have anything you want to, to ask or, or sure, share? Uh, sure, a couple things. I, I'd like to just sort of follow up on on, um, on Tammy's question and also Steve's comments. But, uh, you know, I think the right thing to do for preschool is also the right thing to do for kindergartners. Um, or maybe I said that backwards. But, uh, you know, I, I don't think it would be right for the Hopkins School District to put preschoolers in an unsatisfactory um, educational um, um, facility. So, uh, so treating them the way we, we treat kindergartners, I think, is probably the right way to do it. Um, also, I think it's worth keeping in mind, too, that, um, that we actually get uh, greater adequacy funding for kindergartners now than we ever have before in the past, uh, even going back to the inception of the program. And that was due to a change in state funding that, um, that came into play, uh, will come into play in the FY20 year. I believe I got that correct. So, um, so that's something that's actually reflected on the revenues. So, so I think what what Tammy talked about is is really one of the factors that that is driving, and it's a significant factor that's driving the uh, the facility uh, project, and that's the overcrowding at elementary. And Jim pointed out a couple different ways that that uh, that, that can be developed. There's a couple other things that that came out of her comprehensive engineering study which uh, if you haven't seen it, it's worth taking a look at. It's very long, it's very detailed, it's 111 pages long, thank you, Jay. Um, and it's got diagrams, it's got photos. It, it, uh, it, 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 we threw that, through that engineering study. Um, we learned about what, what's possible and what's really not possible in terms of in terms of any uh, any expansions in our facility, whether that's you know classrooms at at um, Harold Martin or classrooms at Maple Street or additional classroom space at the uh, at the middle high school, and uh, and it also talks about some um, uh, some aspects of our um, school facilities that uh, that do require or or soon will be ready. For, uh, for additional maintenance. So I think to paraphrase Steve, we know more about our facilities now than we ever have in the history of the Hopkinton School District with this comprehensive um, engineering study. So overcrowding at elementary, um, uh, one of the things that came out of, out of uh, the study also was outdated science labs. I think we talked about that two weeks ago, three weeks ago, something like that. Two meetings. Two meetings ago. November first. Um, so, so the, these are all options. These aren't these aren't things that you have to do. But, but science labs that were basically last touched twenty years ago ish, um, and and things uh, and things have changed uh, in terms of best practice, safety and security. Um, I think everybody understands the uh, safety and security challenges that we have, particularly at the uh, at the middle high school. And without getting into it in excruciating detail, if we were to repeat the, um, well, if we were you know going back in time, going back to 1998 and redoing that, we wouldn't do it the way it's the way it was done. So the question for the community is going to be: Do we redo it now, 
or do we live with it the way it's done and address safety and security through other um, through other means? And um, and we have put um, or, and are putting close to four hundred thousand dollars worth of safety and security improvements, largely funded by a um, eighty twenty uh, state uh, grant, um, specifically targeted to uh, for hardening uh, the safety and security of our school buildings. So that's in that's in place and or going into place um, as we speak uh, right now. Um, we've all talked about the accessibility issues. Again, a lot of it manifests itself at the, um, at the middle high school. Um, uh, is it the way we want it? No, it's not the way we want it. Is it the best for kids? No, it's not the best for kids. Um, can, we, can we afford to do better? I don't know, that's the, uh, that's the question. If we were to roll the clock back to 1998, no, we wouldn't have done it that way. But, but, um, but maybe it's something we have to live with, maybe it's something we have to change, and that's a question that's gonna be it for the school board and ultimately for the voters in March. And then the final thing is the deferred maintenance. And a, a number of these deferred maintenance uh, issues have been exposed through the, um, the Harriman uh, engineering report are brought up there. Others have been uh, taken care of over time and worked on over time and planned to be taken care of over time or planned to be moved into a, a, um, a facility project and paid for by a bond. So, um, so uh, we got some additional light on that last week with the, um, with the capital improvement plan. And again, these are questions that are gonna um, uh, you know, be for the school board to make a proposal and the voters to decide. But um, certainly love to, uh, to hear your feedback um, today. Anything, anything, um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, this is Diane LaChance again. I just wanted to speak to something. Um, the speaker before me came up and asked a question and I think it was in um, good faith and earnest and one of the troubles I think people have coming and speaking to the school board is that they bring an idea forward and you know the idea that you know that anybody was suggesting that the preschool or the kindergarten is going to be in substandard conditions that wasn't part of what she said um, and that kind of stops the dialogue and the conversation and the ability to work together um, and I just wanted to bring that um, out in the open because it makes it really hard. Everybody here is trying to work to make this a the solution a good solution. And what I also heard was that um, it hadn't been researched whether or not maybe building a kindergarten or preschool would be really good for that age group, not being in the older kids. One of the things I get concerned about is these young nurturing years where you know there is really a need in society because parents are working and they need a place for their kids. Do I like that it's falling on the taxpayer dollars? No, but there's a reality here. And having them maybe off on their own might be a great idea. I don't know. But it comes to another idea I've heard at other meetings here is we have we done a real feasibility study. You know, I hate to go off and start spending money doing these different things when that's really not what we should be doing. And hearing that some of these things weren't researched and that a lot of deferred maintenance wasn't done. Maybe we need a really need to hire a facilities person to take that off of Steve's back because he's mentioned that he's learned a lot about facilities in the last few years. You know, I'm getting really uncomfortable that we're ready to make a decision to spend a lot of money on facilities um, without some of the um, suggestions that have come up that I think are great and that it could be worked on. And I think we need to start working as a community. It's, it's tough. You know, I'm not sure we have a revenue problem. Maybe we do. If we do, I'll own it. Um, I don't know, and that's why I keep asking for the programmatic budget. So I just hope going forward we can find some way to, you know, work together. That's really what we're doing, trying to do anyway, um, because it doesn't help any of us to have uh, a marginal school system, an average school system. I think everybody in this town cares about education and they want a good school system, but we're seeing the costs, we're seeing revenue issues, and I think we just need um, to really do our homework when we take. Um, a big step because we're talking about lots of money here, millions and millions, um, and that's my concern. Thanks. Diane, I'd like to address your comment. So first, I I think it's important, and I, I I tried to I think get this across some other times, but today there is so much out there information-wise. There have been so many meetings. The people sitting here representing you for the schools and the community have done a very in-depth job 
researching options. Now, obviously, not every option on the planet could potentially be researched because time is limited, resources are limited. But I want to assure you that if individuals do not understand or have the information, that should not translate into that the work is not done. All of these questions being asked can be answered. If there's an option we didn't look at, that is definitely a new idea, right? And, and um, Steve spoke to the fact that no, that, that was not research. But you know, the folks up here, I think, have done an incredible due diligence job um, with the amount of time and resource we have to understand what is lacking right now in terms of deferred maintenance and coming up with a capital improvement plan, which I would say is, and I think Steve would probably say, is the most comprehensive understanding we have ever had for the district. So the information now exists. I think it's important for the conversation to move away from what was not done, why hasn't something been done, what was happening all these years, to now we have prepared a plan, have done a lot of research, and we should be focused on that. And how do we move forward? Because we do want to come to a decision. We do want to address what we can. And we need to hear from the community what they're willing to spend and what's a priority with what we know today. There'll always be additional options and ways to look at things. But if we ever want to move ahead with anything, we have to make some decisions with what we know today. So I want to thank you for your comments and coming up out of the group that's sitting here to express you know, your concerns and comments. But Again, um, not having information should not translate into the work has not been done. Yes, and I, and I do want to show appreciation for hard work, because I know community members like Jay and other people have worked really hard, but it speaks to another issue that I struggled with and some other people did. And um, as the meetings occurred and people participated, the meeting minutes you know, were not available. It took until maybe last week to get the meeting minutes so the people in the community understood what was being discussed and maybe what was not being discussed so that some of these ideas could have come forward in the last two years. Um, so again, there's a lot of work to be done. I'm not saying hard work hasn't been done. My concern is at this point, there's some improvements in communication um, that could help us to make a better decision. Um, and you know, going forward, I think, Steve has been receptive and responsive to getting that information, but it hasn't been there. And I know other people have really struggled um, this whole year trying to get some of that information so that they could bring this forward sooner. Right. I have to respectfully disagree because from my understanding, all of this information has been posted. Well, I'd like Steve, to thank, it wasn't, thank you, Diane, so I didn't mean to interrupt you. But, yeah, but Steve knows he just put it out there for us. The, the steering committee many minutes steering is what the she's referring to. minutes of the internal stuff are just put out there. but. Certainly, all, a lot of the reports and all the summary information. Because that's where the, the community gets an assurance. You have a number of people in the community having conversations, but we have no idea what was discussed or what wasn't discussed. And, you know, that's part of transparency and helpful. And I was looking to those, so I didn't have to come to these meetings. I don't really enjoy coming, but I couldn't read it. So I could say, well, you know, I'm not going to agree with everything, but it looks like they've done their homework. I couldn't do that. So I had to keep coming to meetings asking for it. So I'm, I, I, I don't like standing here criticizing people. I can't tell you, David can tell you how many years I've come to different meetings. And I, I like to say, well, parents should really be involved. And I'm standing here. And I'm not ignorant to the fact that usually there's not one parent behind me. <laughs> All right, so it's, 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 it's not a thank, thankful job sometimes. But um, we are at a point where you're talking about spending a lot of money and the revenues um, are just um, slim. So let's make some really good decisions and try to work going forward. But those are the reasons. That I don't mean to be criticizing, but it's, it's been hard to get the information. Thank you. And Diane, I'm going to take a, take a moment to, to segue to introduce, reintroduce and, and Jay again back to the table with us. And thank you for being here. Um, Jay has been in, in, for those of you who have not met him or don't know him from as a community member, has been the chair of our steering committee now for almost four years. Four years, um, when the work initially started. Um, and so he is um, probably the most, um, n most knowledgeable of all the, the aspects of the, the work that was done um, over the last four years. Um, so if any of you have any specific questions for Jay, we asked him if he'd be willing to come tonight. Um, he's graciously given 
his personal evening again to come and, um, and be here so that any specific questions related to the engineering study that we did commission, he can speak in detail to what was done around that. Um, that was part of the initial uh, feasibility, if you want to call it that, of a facilities project in general. Um, what needed to be done, really identifying the, the most critical needs with relation to things like NEASC and, and, and deferred maintenance, um, safety and security. Um, a lot of that information came out a couple of years ago after the subcommittees did a tremendous amount of work digging into certain aspects such as educational specifications around what is in the best interest of students um, in the community educationally. Um, and so I think, you know, again, Jay is, probably has um, one of the greatest banks of knowledge of all of this over the period of time along with steering committee members Dave and certainly Steve. Um, and anybody else who might be here in the room that was part of one of the steering, part of one of the subcommittees or um, steering committees. So I welcome any of you who are here tonight that might have specific questions for Jay to take this opportunity to um, to ask him about those kinds of things that you may still wonder whether or not um, those kinds of things were were um, part of the part of the original um, process of looking at a project to begin with. By all means, and, and I can I can say that we didn't. We approached the project based on the charges that we were had as we worked through the different options. Uh, one of the, the main points of the second charge we received was the cost. And we did look at that as we put the project together, the cost was obviously a big factor that because we knew that that was going to be a concern. Um, there were things that we ruled out because of the cost almost immediately and there were things that we, we left on the table to be deliberated at, at, at this sort of, sort of forum. So, because something didn't necessarily make it into the, the final report didn't mean it was something we necessarily didn't discuss, but uh, there were things that we were able to rule out fairly early. And understanding that the, the cost of new construction was so high, that was not something that we, we tried to, sh to sh shy away from that where we could because of the cost. And uh, one of the things that interestingly is the initial charge came together was to, uh, to address the, the project with a two school footprint. So close one school. And uh, we thought that, that we could see some savings there by doing that. But we quickly found that with, with the costs, I won't say quickly, what we found with the cost, the construction costs, and the fact that the enrollment continued to grow, that, that reducing the footprint was, was not an option. So uh, I would say we did look at it not only a number of different ways, but from a number of different angles. Because the whole, the whole project changed remarkably as we found what enrollment was, was, was doing and also how expensive things were getting. So uh, for example, and again, just some rough numbers, if we were to look at just strictly uh, uh, a six classroom building, so four kindergarten classes and two preschool classes, just the classrooms alone, uh, no administrative space, uh, no service space, uh, no cafeteria, no library, uh, roughly speaking, that would probably be a two and a half million dollar project. Uh, exclusive of the acquisition cost for the land. So as we did look at things, we wanted to try to, to capitalize on the, on the footprint that we already had here. And we looked at it a number of different ways at each individual location, but uh, standalone gets expensive pretty quick. And even though there may be, as you mentioned, some, some academic reasons to look at that, trying to balance the overall cost was part of our charge, so we tried to keep that in mind as well. Thanks, Jay, very much. Um, and I also want to welcome um, our administrators here this evening as well. And Sam, thank you for also Sam. Sam is one of our student representatives, so we welcome him as well. Um, we'll be doing more formal um, opportunity when we get to our business meeting. Um, does anybody else have anything they'd like to come up and share at the at the microphone with us before we? Sure, Don and then um, Mike back there. Either one. You can. Yeah, there's so much information that's out here that's very difficult to emphasize to the parties. As you all know, I'm a party type setting person. And I think I'm going to need that moving forward in the next couple of months. Uh, I'm pretty comfortable that the safety issue is going to be addressed. We have $400,000 and a lot of work to be done on that. So I think that's, that's, that's my first priority, and I think that's going to be satisfied. My second priority is certain elements in the deferred maintenance million dollars for the rules it is an absolute necessity. There's other things in there that probably aren't of that magnitude, but they're important. So I'm going to say that that's another X amount of thousands of dollars. The next 
a couple of priorities of my uh, idea would be the fire suppression down at Carroll Martin. That's an asset protection and probably a safety issue that really needs to be front and center. That's got a real swing item of anyways from five hundred thousand dollars to a million five. Probably talking with Jay when you get into how you do the cistern and how you supply the water to that. So that's a that's a big swing item, but it's a high priority item. The next one would be we need more space. We need four classrooms somewhere of some type. And as I understand it, the four classrooms at Harold Martin would be in the range of at least four million dollars to do. Is that a correct number? Three point two was the latest. Okay, three million whatever. <laughs> the item, another solution to that, whether it's physically located there or not, would be the, the portable classrooms. The portable classrooms would probably be located quicker than could be the, the, the actual hard construction. And with the uncertainty of where our role is going. And that's driving some of that, that need for that extra classroom. Uh, this is just an option. Would, would it be smart to look at the four, the four or five to one ratio of portable classrooms to the hardcore construction and give us some time to assess in the next five years whether that increased space is really going to be needed. If we have it in the portable area, obviously it can go away. Or it could be said, no, it's not a satisfactory. We really need to do it some later date down the path to say, let's go with the hard construction and get rid of the portables. How you put the portables down there to me is going to be quite a challenge because you've got not much land, you've got a sloped area, which is easier to build on. Where the portables would go, and somebody just raised a question here, do we have to have them down there in this interim one to two to three to five years time span? Might, might those portables be located someplace else? Quote unquote, they're going to be portables, so we'll leave them inside, leave them there, move them down to Harold, or build hard construction at Harold. The upgrade of the science labs is obviously a, a key out item, too. And he asked, you know, that's an important void still left there. The question is, do we need to do four of them? And again, that, that price range is about $2 million, as I understand it. Would it be another alternative to say we do some of that? We obviously, I think we need to do some. We need to do, say, 500,000, at least do one room, but maybe not do all of them, because I think I've got a priority that we need to address how the town feels about this. The accessibility problem with the elevator entering into the classroom and not having a good system for disabled people to move around the high school might be a concern that uh, suggested to take half the money that you would take to do all of the labs to re-upgrade those and take a million to a million and a half perhaps and solve to some degree that handicap accessibility. The right? idea yeah, there would be come in from the north entrance, go into the elevator and go up that way and then redo that classroom, take half, half of that away, <clears throat> spend the money to do that and also spend the money to continue that hallway down to the boys and girls bathroom near the auditorium. You know, the big, the big charge is, of course, the complete fix for that is to go the whole way into it so the west side comes down through the hallway and do the whole thing, but just do maybe half of it to give you the solution to the elevator problem and the ramps and whatever between level four and five. But again, that's a question, and I, I'm hoping all these alternatives come out and so that you get some kind of feedback from the, from the town in total, rather than just going to town meeting with it all just as a, as a hardcore thing, try to get some feel for, do people want to split some of that money up? <clears throat> the other thing is short-term versus long-term bonds. Looking at the proposal was last year, the, the short-term bond, a 10-year one, saves hundreds of thousands, maybe millions, versus the, the long, 20-year bond, you can't borrow quite as much to do with the 10, but maybe for the short-term fuse, because we've got, we've got four items. We've got the town budget, we've got the operating budget, we've got the facility thing, and all those thrown together is what I, as one of the budget committees, will be looking at the whole thing. So if we can you know, short-change perhaps the school rather than the total thing by doing some short-term, get us through five years or six or seven years, then rebond it again at a different time when we Hopefully we'll have better information available to us. Thank you. Thank you, Akla.
three, three, Mike Martin, uh, three quick points. Again, when talking with folks in town, the comment is everybody says taxes are not getting too high. If that is not in your plan somehow, I don't think you're going to be successful. Could you just lean in a little further to it? Is that better? Yeah. yeah. There you okay, go. I'm sorry. I said uh, that what I hear from the people in town is that everybody thinks taxes are too high in Hopkin and, and somehow that has to be in the plan. Number two, somebody mentioned to me that, or somebody asked the question about the Harold Martin plan or the high school plan. Um, an old, I'm an old time administrator, uh, public schools. I've always heard from my mentors that you, one person is in charge of the building. I think the high school's got enough grades in it. It's just, you know, somebody's gonna be adding a sixth grade to that. I think you're just going in the wrong directions when you have three buildings. I think somebody would have enough to do with just four grades in a high school, even in Hopkinton. But I just don't, I just think that's a span. I think it's gonna be an unattractive position if you should ever have to fill it again, and chances are you will have to fill it again because we all have uh, an end to our longevity. Finally, I haven't been following closely, but I would like the board to quietly open the library for the kids. I think it's time that library get opened. I, I don't know what the things are, I don't know what all the problems are, but I know there's a community room in there. One of, your, one of this town's biggest assets that may be overlooked is that kids who read at exceptionally high levels perform at higher levels on their tests. That library is a huge asset to this community. Every kid should have a library card. Every kid should go to the library. And my God, the videos are free. So take the video, take the book, go home and read the book. But go to, get the library open, it's time. When you walk into that thing in the Slusser Center, it's wonderful, the people are great. The facility's not very welcoming to kids. We have a child's library in the library. I, I just, just think it's there. We want to advantage our kids. We want those second, third graders reading at fourth and fifth grade level. And I think if everybody that I've ever worked with in public schools basically agree, the better the reading level, the higher the performing of the kids. We have a tremendous library. I'm not trying to put the selectmen on notice, but I think I think the kids are watching. This board has a chance to create some urgency to get it open, even if it's partially open. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, first, just a quick moment to uh, acknowledge all the hard work that everyone in this whole process has put together. Acknowledge the hard work that everyone has put into this. It occurred to me last week during the budget process that um, Mr. Chamberlain and everyone here has been juggling multiple balls. Steering committee, feasibility study, budget uh, requests from me for information, uh, and done it with um, just upstandingly. And uh, managing the Siemens report, so um, I realize that this is a tough, tough charge that you've been put forth, uh, put forth here. Um, so I, for me, it comes down to needs versus wants in terms of what I would like the school board to look at because there's a heck of a lot of both. Uh, and until last week, I was under the premise, of the overriding assumption that we had $10 million in needs. That was uh, 6.9 in deferred maintenance and another three in change in safety and security for a total of 10 million in needs. But I'm a little confused about the capital improvements plan, oh, which I forgot to mention. Another thing he's working on. Capital improvements plan is fantastic. Um, but I'm a little confused, if you could clarify for me a little bit about what is in capital improvements plan and what is being carried forward. I think the board needs to understand that a little better, or maybe I didn't just grasp it myself from last week, because it looks like a lot of the deferred maintenance um, is possibly deferred out even further, or not in several areas it says, you know, omitted from this plan. So to me, that drops that 10 million number a lot lower. So I think it's, I think I applaud you if, if we can feasibly spread it out uh, it gives us more flexibility and takes away that 10 million in needs. But I really would like more clarification on what is an immediate need like a roof and what is it. Sure. Um, how the CIP was developed was trying to take a look at based on a standard how much we should put in each building based on the replacement cost. And so the 
there is a, a, some deferred maintenance that's in the facility project. And I think on that night when I unpacked unpack that, I think that got down to, as you said, 6.8 million. So, but if the board decided not, that didn't pass, or it's, it's not feasible to put that in the project, then we took the pieces and based on how much we, the standard is to, con to contribute, started taking a look at that funding level and then planning them with that support. So, so the facility recommended facility project column is the total, and then it's broken down over the next five years to, to catch up based on the three percent standard. Okay. If we spent that, then we could take care of it in about five years. And then the two numbers in the totals column down below. The the green is the yeah. standard. Gotcha. And the other number is what we would pay oh. that year. Okay. So I applaud you for taking a look at that. That's awesome, and that gives us a lot more flexibility. I love that. Well, that was uh, Jay Burgess College, just. So. I have to acknowledge the support of our community members. Critical, obviously. Um, so, uh, excuse me, Paul. So my last. So for me, needs versus wants. For me, the biggest need, honestly, is a ten-year plan. A ten-year plan. I spoke to a facility steering committee member who is a local project manager and architect, um, referenced many times at these meetings, and he was shocked that we don't have a ten-year plan. Uh, and as, uh, so, multiple people. Uh, feel very strongly that we need some overriding guidance on where we're going in the future so that we don't end up here again. So I, that's number one for me. Uh, for me to support anything, I would like to see that brought forward uh, for the next year. Um, some degree of safety and security based on your capital improvements plan, defer what we can, not. Some, some degree uh, of deferred maintenance, probably a lot of deferred maintenance. Um, and the space issue for me is there's two options. Mobile units, did you get a, a chance to get a lease price on mobile units? You didn't. Oh, I actually got one. It's $21,000 for 12 months. Uh, that's for bathroom, hand, one, one 1,000 square foot mobile unit. That includes bathroom, handicap ramp, skirting, setup, transport, and removal after 12 months, which is another $3,000. So if we didn't remove it after 12 months, you could take away $3,000 and make it $18,000 for one 1,000 square foot classroom. So if we need that, what about waiting another year, putting in one perhaps at Harold Martin next year, uh, or none, um, or over the next couple years, because this plan won't be done until 2021. And so that gives us another year, which is uh, all it should take to conduct a 10-year master plan. Uh, it should be done in about a year to really think about where the best place to build is. Because I kind of like the idea of, of sixth grade in high school. I, I recognize the um, importance of the educational benefit. But for me, plopping it at the end, and I'm sorry, sorry to use that word, um, placing it at the end of a long high school high hallway where the sixth graders have to traipse down an entire length of high school students to get to all of their specials is not isolating it. So um, if we want to bring sixth grade out there, let's come up with a, a feasible plan of sixth, seventh, eighth isolated, some sort of degree of, of true isolation and not just four classrooms together. Uh, so the 10-year plan, I'm hoping, would help to do that for us. Um, and that's all I have. I'm sure there's more. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, it's Danae Bell. Um, so thank you guys all for your hard work. Um, I have two kids in the school system. I um, have the privilege now of stepping in the school system, and I'm loving every minute of it. Um, but it also really opens my eyes to um, when I hear a lot of community members who don't have who don't walk the halls on a routine basis um, and are only looking at the dollar amount, which is important to me too, because you know my house payment is going up for my taxes um, again this year. Um, so I get that, like I get that dollar amount and I get the frustration when you see dollar amounts raising. Um, but we, do, we are tight in the schools, it's true. You guys see it, you guys know it, this is why you're working to get us more room. Um, it's tight and um, so thank you for all your hard work, and I feel like I feel like I need to finish the <laughs> um, for the battery. Um, so thank you for what you're doing. I really appreciate it. Um, for me, priorities for me are, um, you know, getting more room in our schools, getting the safety where it needs to be, um, and getting, you know, like, at, you know, I've spoke before in another meeting about how I'm, I'm not a huge fan of moving sixth grade up. Um, that's not my first choice, but if moving the sixth grade up would allow us to get the ADA compliance, like if we need to put all of our, you know, like most of our vote 
you know, like on the high school to get the ADA compliance, to get everything, if that would, with shifting everything, get us enough room here and at Harold Martin, then I feel like that's what we need to do to have the most cost effective. That's not my first choice. But, you know, like Harold Martin, we, they need an art room back. Like I had the privilege of teaching in the first grade what used to be art room. And there's a kiln in there that she wants to use. And then they're trying to figure out how to put a wall up. Well, you can't run a kiln with a classroom because it's going to be 100 degrees in there. So it's like there's, there's equipment that we have in our buildings that we can't use because we're so tight. And so I think that that's what I want the community to understand is that there's stuff in our buildings that we can't use because we're having to use these spaces for educational purposes. And though I also understand the idea of let's throw up a mobile unit because it's cheap and it's easy. But when you're trying to deal with kids who get overwhelmed and need to take a hall break and need to go walk to take a break because they're overstimulated in classrooms, if you're in a mobile unit, how is that going to be a safe way to do that? Like you can't, you can't do that. So I think that there's, I think that there's things that people don't think about when they think about the, the short term, you know, like let's fix this, let's just throw something up and put some kids in. And I know that people don't really are completely thinking that way. They just want something that's more cost effective and more now. Um, but being able to be in the school systems and see the challenges that arise from that, that that's going to cause a whole nother level of issues with having mobile units. And maybe that's where we need to go with it. But I do think that there would have to be an extra level of staffing that goes along with that. And um, in order to support these kids that need to take the breaks, and how are we supervising them walking, and how are we insulating and air conditioning, you know, like, and keeping this a safe system to transport these kids back and forth and, and go places when they need breaks out of the classroom. Because um, I, I, I see that. Um, so I think that, that would have, have to be something I think the people would need to understand that there's going to have to be an extra level of staffing that goes along with that, as it would be if you move to the kindergarten and everything over. There's a lot of services that kindergartners are getting that how are those people, they're going to not get those services if they're at another third building because all those services need to be with older kids. So do you not give the kindergartners those services or do you have these people driving back and forth and having a lot of downtime when they're not providing services? So. Um, maybe to help people understand, like, you know, when you're putting a thing out, like addressing some of those, you know, having people talk about that. I'm not a professional educator. I'm a professional nurse. That's my number one job. Um, but uh, I'm having a great time subbing, and I'm learning a lot um, subbing and being in the school systems, and I love it. And you know, I'm, I'm, get, I'm getting plenty of, of jobs. <laughs> 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 so, so thank you for what you do. Thank you. thank you for everything you guys are doing. I really appreciate it. And I see the struggles. I see the struggles in our schools. And I just wanted to come and say thank you and address some of the issues that I hear you guys getting from a different perspective of where it is to be in your schools. So, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else who has not come up to the microphone this evening that would like an opportunity to? Amanda, did you want to come up again? I was going to say this. I was going to say this because it relates more to the budget than it does to the overall project. But the last uh, discussion just on, on the mobile units, I think, is a little short-sighted. Uh, because, correct me if I'm wrong, we need classrooms today. Yes, OK. It would be nice. So we need classrooms today. Okay. We could use them today. We need them next year. More than likely. More than likely. So what I'm talking about is this piece of this project will not be completed if we pass it this year until fall of 2021. So mobile units are very likely in our future, even if we pass the bond. And I don't want my kids in a mobile unit. I don't. But something's happening in the next two years. So that's the reason for the discussion on the mobile units. Mobile units come fully insulated and with HVAC. Okay. So there is a staffing issue. That totally viable point. However. I just realized that for next year, there is nothing in the budget for a mobile unit. And as I said, I don't want my kids in a mobile unit, but I have tremendous reservation about the art and music on a cart, which was part of the discussion last week. So there's currently one classroom short. I know that you're entertaining multiple ideas to try and make this work uh, for everybody, 
but there's so many drawbacks to art music on a cart, and we already have music on a cart periodically as of right now. I know businesses where the bongos have interrupted learning time in adjacent third grade classrooms. I know that it's frustrating for the music teacher currently, who is a godsend, uh, to try and transport all, you know, what he wants and, and, and give proper instruction and due diligence to music. And I don't want him to get frustrated, and I don't want Ms. Emerson to get frustrated. I want them to have their classroom space back. I don't know what the right answer is for that. I don't know if it is a mobile unit, uh, but I ask that you really thoughtfully consider the possibility of uh, uh, finding a way to get them their classroom back next year in some capacity that's not on a cart. Um, and as for the possible solutions, um, I know you said possibly a small kindergarten classroom. Um, I don't particularly like that 500 square foot thing as a classroom, but I'm not an ed educator, so I don't know the ins and outs of that. Uh, and you mentioned reducing the class size of f first grade from 50 to 16 up to 20 to 21, so from four classes to three, which seems reasonable to me. I, I, I prefer 15 or 16, but um, th that's a luxury, honestly, that we enjoy in this town. Uh, and so if 2021 makes more sense and the instructional support can be provided, the IA can be provided, which is my concern because in the third grade, as Mr. Carrozza and I have talked about, there's a heavy load of IEPs and behavioral issues and there are large classes of 23 to 24 and the kids are struggling, all the teachers are struggling. And so our best asset in this town is not our buildings, that's why we're here. Our best asset in this town are our teachers and if we continue to frustrate our teachers, we don't have anything. So I ask you consider Thank that you. option. Appreciate Thanks. it. Yeah. Um, if, um, if, if everyone is um, finished coming up to the microphone, I'd like to give the board members one last chance to, to either ask or um, share anything at this point in time before we close the listening post. We'll be moving on directly to a uh, quick public hearing and then from there into our regular business meeting. So Jim, do you have anything at this point before we close out the listening post? No. There'll be two opportunities during our regular business meeting as well. Um, to come to the microphone and share your input with us as well. So, um, you're all no, set? I say nothing at this time. Okay. We have it on the agenda. We keep talking about it. So, yeah, Dave. So, um, yeah, only to really thank everybody for coming out tonight and uh, and sharing their opinions. I know we got some some new opinions tonight on new new feedback tonight on things too, and we will certainly be taking all of that into consideration along with the uh, the, the uh, you know mountain of work that's been uh, that's been done so far. So. Uh, Thanks again. I'm all set. Um, and again, thank you all um, for, for attending this evening. And I encourage you all to stay for the remainder of the meeting this evening. We'll be covering the revenue part of the operating budget. We covered expenses, uh, the operating budget last week. Um, but just a quick sort of overview of um, where we are right now. So today is December 13th, yes? Um, so we, the school board has um, another meeting scheduled for next Thursday, um, and then we have a if needed meeting scheduled for um, January 3rd. Um, at that point, we will need to complete our work on both the operating budget that will that will be um, given to the budget committee for consideration, as well as um, potentially um, a facilities project. So it's really the board's responsibility at this point to take all this information, which is why we feel it's really important for you all um, to have the opportunity to be with us this evening um, so that we can take all the feedback and the input we get from not only tonight, but from previous meetings as well as any other communication via email um, that, um, that we really do take, um, take it very seriously and we want to be able to make the, the decision that we feel is in the community's best interest um, from a lot of different perspectives. So thank you again, we, we do value it a lot. Um, at this point, I'd like to close the listening post and Steve, if it's okay, open the public hearing. Okay, excellent. Close the listening post at 5.55. Yeah, to take up a quick break? Okay. Let's roll right into the, let's take a break between the public hearing and the meeting, how's that? Sure. Okay. So uh, the public hearing tonight is about uh, withdrawing funds related to the repair of an underground storage to the oil tank out in the middle of high school. Uh, so just a little bit where we are on the journey. We were noticed uh, and found out about the notice about some deficiencies to the Department of Environmental Services. There is three um, deficiencies to our 30-plus-year-old tank out in the high school. One is, is this uh, apparatus called cathodic protection, uh, which prevents corrosion 
um, by charging the metal, that cathodic protection um, went below the acceptable amount about a year ago. So that's the first piece is cathodic protection. The second piece is the replacement of a spill bucket. When they fill uh, the oil tank, there's a bucket to, to, to prevent it from going um, out into the environment, and a bucket to collect it, and that is deficient. That has been fixed temporarily, but not a long-term fix. And the third aspect of the uh, tank issue is the supply. So we have four appliances at Hopton Middle High School that are fed by oil. Two, uh, one uh, older boiler, one new boiler, and two hot water heaters. And on uh, certain times, when those four appliances all require uh, oil at the same time, the supply through a day tank is not sufficient to meet that need, and then it goes into what's called flame failure. So we were, uh, we were cited uh, for those deficiencies. Uh, we originally, in March of last year, uh, put together a project to replace the underground tank with an above-ground tank, uh, and uh, uh, that price was uh, uh, that price was about one hundred sixteen thousand. Oh, how much? About one hundred thirty, right? It was one hundred thirty. Yeah. One hundred thirty. So um, the board uh, looked at that, and then early, I guess, in the fall. Um, they decided to take a look at um, repair, which is, uh, though we, uh, we, got a, a firm, or we got a firmer quote today um, at $12,370, but the posting is for $10,000. So the, other, the board decided the gap would be through the regular funds, which is perfectly appropriate. So the, the three, the cathodic protection in the spill bucket, the cathodic protection chain, uh, fix is $8,650. The spill bucket is 3720 and in communicating with the Department of Environmental Services as a short-term fix, and when we're looking at putting this kind of money into a, a tank, this we're looking at hoping to get five, six plus years, is to look at a, we had a design for a spill bucket, I'm sorry, another day tank, which would give us enough supply for the four appliances. That is about $30,000, and according to Chuck Corliss from DES, uh, we're going to look at in the next week a, uh, a what's called a fat pipe, which he believes would be significantly cheaper. The best fix is a new day tank, um, but adding a fat pipe builds a reservoir within the room, and so the pipe is bigger and there's oil in the pipe, and if the four appliances all draw at the same time, instead of drawing oil from a half pipe, half inch pipe, it would draw oil from a bigger supply, reducing the frequency of the flame out. So it, we, by installing a new boiler, we have decreased the number of flame outs, but there's still, I think we've had three in the last, since Thanksgiving, which is less than we used to. Uh, adding the fat pipe would decrease it even more. I mean, we can't guarantee that we won't have any flame outs, but we do believe that the frequency would be reduced and the cathodic protection, we have a quote and the opportunity, I think the second week in July, uh, January, second week in January to take care of that. The most urgent piece is applying the cathodic protection as soon as possible, which would stop any concern about corrosion. So what would, if the board approves tonight um, the action item, um, we do the PO, we schedule the cathodic protection in the spill bucket, then in the next week, we try and get a new design for a fat pipe, hopefully less than the $30,000 quote that we had for a new day tank. If we come back, depending on that price, have another public hearing if the board decides to take it from the maintenance trust or look for it in the budget. So tonight is the most urgent because it stops the corrosion with cathodic protection, which is a good thing. Uh, and that satisfies the two components of the DES and uh, they're very happy about so they'll be very happy when we get the cathodic protection on and then once we redesign with what we think is a cheaper than a new uh, day tank a, a fat pipe then i think we'll be up and running and meet all our requirements and hopefully reduce even more the frequency of flame out. so that is our underground storage tank story at hopton middle and high school Second week in January is the estimate. He's, uh, uh, Lakes Region Environmental is a vendor uh, recommended by the um, Department of Energy on their website as an approved vendor for this work. And, and early indications are that we can get in the, in the queue second week of January. Any um, questions?
questions for Steve from the board. I right, said so that that pipe does that replace that whole supply line? It would replace the day tank. Just the, the, day, the day, tank. day tank, and it would directly it would directly feed all it would feed uh, four appliances. So that supply line that's underground. Oh, no, which no, is I'm not sorry. Visible it would not be touched. Correct. This is going from the existing half pipe to a bigger pipe to the four appliances. It is not going from the tank through the school. We're not redoing it. For the unknown. Yeah. Getting addressed. David, Jim, Jim any questions for Steve? On on the thank you. Thank you, Steve. No problem. Thank you. So it is tonight is an action item for two things. One is to withdraw funds, and one is to award the contract. And this newest estimate that you received today is the one that we're working with. Yes, that you're working with. Term. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. So the board can make a decision to either increase the action item to the total amount, right, or, or to leave it at the ten, and then we'll take, take the remainder out of the the budget. Yep. We're on the agenda. And just for the record, the balance yeah. of the repair maintenance trust currently stands at the balance. Uh, it's uh, two eighty. 283. 283. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. And uh, tonight, um, I'll be talking about, in a few minutes, uh, all the trusts and planned expenditures. Um, there is right now, up until tonight, $40,000 planned expenditures. That would raise that to 50. Um, but I still think, um, that, and I'll talk about a, a, an approach to facilities within the maintenance trust and within the budget operation. So we, we do have this as a, an item of board discussion um, on our regular business agenda and then an action item. Is everybody on the board at this point comfortable with the action item and any other questions they have between now and then? Um, we'll ask during that item for board discussion. Just in full transparency, the action item is not more than 13000 so if you want to adjust that to the posting, okay. feel free. Or uh, I believe it is, um, as long as you're at the hearing and in transparency, you can amend it tonight. To change that. But if you want to stick with it, no problem. Right. We can decide that in the under board discussion. <coughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Excellent. All right. Um, was there a comment? Yeah. I, what's that? Was there a comment? No. Um, comment. Yes. So, um, yeah, I'm just thinking through a little bit. Um, at this point, I'd like to offer up the opportunity for the public to provide comment to the board on this particular item. Uh, there's also two more opportunities within the, the body of the board meeting as well, so I was just thinking about it for a second, because we will be discussing it again during the board meeting, um, just to review it one more time before we take action on it. So, But on this particular um, public hearing. Uh, I applaud you for coming up with the larger fat pipe, great outside the box thought. Um, I did tour the thing myself, and I saw the underground, and I saw the one-and-a-half-inch supply line, and ultimately it needs to be replaced. My issue was doing it so soon, right? So I'm sure you're going to stick this on your CIP for the future, because that hundred and I thought it was $16,000 um, outdoor tank uh, does seem like a good option in the long term. Right. We'll be adding it. We, are, we have the Maple Street one uh, on the CIP as we speak. And Amanda, what we did is, because that pricing is this year, and we knew it wouldn't be approved till next year, we increased it about 15% oh, because okay. of, yeah. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, any other comments on the public hearing itself? Otherwise, we'll close the public hearing out, and we'll move on. We'll take a quick break, if that's all right, at 6.05. We'll take about a five-minute break if everyone wants to take and jog up and down the hallway a couple of times <laughs> before they come back in. Well, then we'll start our business meeting um, at about 6.10. Here's my chance. We should all just give some of the awards. Just in case we run out of tape tonight. I'll look for one of those big ones. Big ones. Thanks, Jay. Can you get some of the time again? I would, but not as much as you want. I'm here. It's up to you.
Excellent. I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Hopkins School Board on Thursday, December 13th at 618. Thank you and welcome back to those of you who, um, who stayed following the public hearing in the listening post. Uh, because we've already taken care of the Pledge of Allegiance for this evening, um, we'll go right to additions and deletions to the agenda. We do. We have a revised agenda. Um, so we are eliminating the, uh, one of the personnel issues. We don't have a nomination tonight. We've added under non-public a, um, a legal question to update the board on. We have a nomination for the curriculum design specialist Titan Matt Krogman, and we have the Lakes Region Environmental $13,000 for the Cathodic Protection Spill Budget Bucket, and we have taken that money out of the trust. Okay. Excellent. Any correspondence this evening? None. None. Um, in the packet was a set of minutes from the school board meeting, the regular board meeting held on December 6, 2018. I'll take a motion to approve those, please. So moved, but I need to make one correction. I was not present. It says absent. Oh, perfect. You're right. You were absent, according You're to absent. those. <laughs> Good catch. <laughs> uh, I'll take a motion to uh, to approve those minutes. So moved. I'll second it. Uh, any further comment. changes, clarifications, Jim? Yeah. So um, this is on page. page I am. I'm on page three. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm struggling with what the change is, but I'll tell you my problem, and then you can help okay. me figure out what the change is. So, uh, so this is on the third, I guess, the third paragraph, and it says, Jim O'Brien stated that the budget committee voted on the programmatic budget, which is true, um, and felt that there was no need for committee members to meet with the superintendent and school board members at the time. Um, I think that was in a conversation. It was a request by a member of the public to, um, to meet in a meeting that we decided that we were going to have with the superintendent. So it, it just reads like we're saying that people don't, shouldn't meet with the superintendent. That wasn't really what we were saying. It was a very specific question about being in on a discussion about it. And so I don't know how to, I guess I would suggest um, maybe striking that line. Um, okay. Striking that first line? Or just striking, uh, you know, yeah, putting a period something. after the word budget and okay. then striking the rest of that sentence. Great. Uh, Don, did you catch that from Jim? Okay. okay. Great. Does that make Jim. sense? Yep. Thank you. Uh, any any th other changes? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. We will have the non-public minutes of that meeting for the next uh, next week. Okay. Great. Thank you. At this point, we have an opportunity for public comment. We'll have another opportunity toward the end of our meeting tonight. If any anyone here would like to come up to the microphone and share with us um, uh, some feedback, um, either on the, the the listening post, the public hearing, or anything else um, that may be on your mind this evening. Anybody want to wait through the rest of the meeting? Sounds good. Um, comments from the Hopkinton School Board. Sam, let's start with you tonight over there. Anything for us tonight? Uh, just to pass on some appreciation from students and on other people who are in and out of the building frequently for the addition of the buzzers on the doors, now on the front and the parking lot entrance door. Uh, it really makes a difference for all of the students and for the office staff. It's a really great step in the right direction. Good. Excellent. Up and running. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sam, for communicating that to us. Uh, any, uh, Jim, down at your end? Nothing tonight. Thank you. I'm good. Dave, you good? Good. Excellent. All right. Well, I'm going to continue to move this meeting on since we have quite a, quite a substantial agenda tonight. Um, we'll move right on to presentation and staff reports. I'll turn it over to Steve for continuation of the fiscal, 20, fiscal year 20 budget. Sure. Just an update on where we were. Last week, I presented the superintendent's budget with um, some digging in on the four drivers. We talked about health insurance and the 400000 inch increase. We talked about the staffing. We talked about facilities and special ed. Um, so that is the expense side of the budget, and this year it's on. This year we had an anomaly of four out of six possible drivers all happen at the same time, which puts an enormous pressure on the budget. So tonight, the second meeting uh, of this process is we're going to take a look at um, the capital improvement maintenance trust piece. We're going to look at the tax, all the trusts, the vehicle, the special education trust, the maintenance trust. We're going to take a look at tax rate stabilization. No. And we're going to take a look at two different tax rates. One tax rate, if there is all the maintenance that we talked about last meeting, is not uh, bonded, but put absorbed in the FY20 budget. So that, that it's a sense of urgency, and we have to get that done. 
The other uh, tax rate would be if this is put into either a different, either a, a shorter term maintenance bond or a facility project. So um, that's our goal tonight. And then after this, you'll see, um, we're going to walk through some next steps where the board will provide, I hope the board provides guidance to me on um, working with the leadership team on what kind of scenarios we want to look. We call those tiers reductions and all that piece. So the maintenance trust. Um, so this is established in 1993, and in 2008, the board became ages to expand. It is for the repair, renovation, related services of Hopkins High School, Maple Street School, and Harrow Market. So uh, this is where we have $283,000. Now, up until tonight, I wasn't sure what was going to happen tonight. There's, uh, we are expected to expend about $41,000. That is, well, tonight will be updated about uh, 12,000 plus. So it could be about 53,000 based on the tank. What we're planning to spend this year, we're spending uh, some furnishings, um, some work on. We're going to circulate pumps. What if we get the circulating pumps? We're replacing two circulating pumps and we're doing some carpet at Maple Street School. So um, that combined with the twelve or thirteen thousand dollars would be our expected expenditures this year. Um, so one of the things that I've been looking at and been supported by by Jay and Michelle and Bill Caruso is how to look at uh, funding our capital improvement program and in the maintenance trust. So, um, and I really appreciate the conversation we have with Jay. Not atypical for superintendents, the maintenance trust was designed to, as a self-insurance. So I went back and looked at some of the founding documents, went back and looked at some other research and connections that was done by a, a preceding superintendent. And for a long time, the maintenance trust was our self-insurance against something unforeseen that was significant. What I usually use up until this year is if we have a boiler that goes, the hope is not to impact educational programs and freeze the budget and, and change the program to transfer funds, but to go to the maintenance trust and have the boiler replaced. Um, so that is what's traditional, the, re the reactive approach to maintenance funding. One of the things that we've done for the performance contract for the first time, I'm pleased to stand in front of the community and say that we are in the best shape we've been in for boilers. Five-year-old boiler at Harold, a brand of a months old boiler at Maple, and months old boiler at the high school. We think, and we're trying to get confirmation, that each one of those boilers could carry the load for the entire school. So uh, the biggest, the, the concern, or what gives me a sense of urgency is the heating season what if we lose a boiler? Well, now, because of where we are, if we lose a boiler, I think we can still carry it short term and not have a 50 degree school or even worse and break pipes. So that's a good place to be. So in speaking with Jay and Michelle today, one of the things that we want to look at, we have 200, and after, after tonight and this year, we'll have about $240,000 in the maintenance trust. If we can work on, based on the standard that we've talked about, and fund capital areas of the budget, those are the ones that are $10,000 or more, lifespan for 10 or more years, if we can look at an acceptable, palpable amount that we can count on, say $100,000, then we can start planning with that amount. And even though in the CIP it was significant more than that, and I understand uh, community fully funding a CIP is, is rare. But if we could budget, let's say, $100,000 for capital, we could use that as insurance against a rooftop unit, heat recovery unit, or a boiler. And we could deploy a, a significant amount of the maintenance trust and, and take a look at using a budget as a reserve. So how would this work? So if the board decides that, Steve, we're going to put $100,000 in, in the capital area of the budget, and the plan is for this is to replace two heat recovery units at Maple Street School. We get that approved July 1. We use that $100,000, it's in our account, account, and we get through the heating system. That $100,000 is there if we need it. If the heating something goes, we can use that fund for something else related. If we get through the heating system, then we pull the trigger and we replace that heat recovery unit. 
So it would be using the, the authorization or the funds within the budget as a reserve, which means we could put into operations about $190,000 next year. So in theory, $100,000 goes in now. What I've asked for in the CIP is closer to a million dollars. And I understand that. But if we did $100,000 in capital improvement, and that survived March, July 1, we'd have $100,000. I mean, July 1, we could deploy $190,000 and catch up some of this deferred maintenance. Then we go through, we still have $100,000 in the account. We get through the heating season. Then we take on that $100,000, and there's the next $100,000 to replace. And we have responded to the community need, and I completely understand the appeal of making sure we start taking care of this and doing a better job. I think we've done a good job. But now, as Dave Blitz said, we had a Siemens report. He recovered units, and even something is changing a um, air conditioning system, which is very expensive, is all new. But now we know this, with $100,000 in, we can use that as self-insurance for the budget, implement it in the spring after the heating season, and then really look at deploying our maintenance trust and getting those funds used to improve the quality of our buildings. Um, so I'm asking the board to consider that approach, which would allow us to really hit some deferred maintenance out of the maintenance trust and using that $100,000 as the self-insurance through the heating season. Um, we're also going to start looking at then, and, and this is where it all comes together. If, if the board decided to give $200,000, that would change our, our schedule for savings. Because we do have to start projecting now from another oil tank here to more heat recovery units there to things that may, may or may not be a facility project. But this is a fundamental shift from the typical school administrator leadership which says, let's have 150,000 always, because we could lose a <coughs> boiler to, let's have a capital area in the budget for anything over 10,000, and let's deploy these funds as quickly as we can to reduce our uh, deferred maintenance. So think about that as you start forming this budget, December 20, maybe into January 3rd. But for those of that's a little bit different, Jay and I had a pretty extensive conversation about this approach today. So the takeaway is we have 280,000, we're going to spend about 55. If we budget 100, we might be able to deploy next year a total of $300,000 on our facilities, which I think we put a good footing going forward. Let's take a look at the special education trust. And then what you're going to hear from me now and going forward, when we start looking at tiers and we start looking at numbers, is from here on in, it is about risk. It was risk for Val, who was a former director of student services for Megan. Now, Becky, I look back in the eye and say, what do you think, Becky, about $169,000 as a current level of funding in the special education trust? Again, here, this money is put aside that in case of, and this, is, this was found in 2005, and I'm very grateful that we changed the name because I could actually type special education trust. I didn't have to go back and change it, which I've had to do for the last five years. Um, this is to educate the education system disabled for unanticipated special education costs. We, um, get, we cannot predict um, the needs of students going forward, whether it's current students or students moving in. So the notion here is that if someone moves in with very complex needs, again, we don't have to freeze the budget. We can draw in reserves to maintain academic program and still meet the needs of a, of a student. $169,000, as, as Becky uh, believes and has communicated to me, is a non-residential, not heavy transportation <coughs> placement for a student, or for a student. For one year. For one year. So this would be bridge, that would be bridge. Now, if, if Becky would sleep better at night, if it was 200,000, we'd all sleep better at night, but we have to mitigate because there's a, a significant pressure on different aspects of the budget. So we're not sure how we're gonna need that this year. Um, it, Tonight or next week, the board is going to say to Michelle and me, we want, at the end of this year, we want $500,000 in unreserved fund balance. If they want $700,000 in unreserved fund balance, that impacts things. If they want $300,000 in unreserved fund balance, that impacts it. Sometimes what is hard, what's taking a long time for me to get used to is it sometimes take two budget years to reconcile with costs. For example, I presented a budget last year, this time in December. 
Well, in January, we had significant students move in. Too late to put those in this year's budget. So we're not caught up. So we are behind in special education costs this year. How, so if, if that is a, an, an upwards of a $200,000 deficit, and the board wants $500,000 unreserved fund balance, then Michelle and I are gonna to have to make this significant decision to say we're gonna freeze the budget January 5th. Because we, and then the board will be making the statement to the community, your tax rate will not go up more than this. In, in my 10 years of working with Michelle, and I suspect going back to my predecessors, I don't believe there's a time we haven't made that commit, met that commitment. So, and, um, so that's a very serious commitment that the board and Michelle monitors and we make that we want to make sure that your taxes, the tax rate will not be greater than. So it's at 169.8 and there's not a recommendation to add any more. It's been this level for a few years. Vehicle replacement trucks. There's about $29,000 in there. We do not have an expect, no, no expected um, withdrawal this year, but we do have planned to replace a small bus in FY21 at 50,000, and a van in, in 2022 at 23,000, and we're planning to add 15,000 dollars here. This is our projected uh, replacement plan and funding level for our fleet. Our fleet is a fully accessible bus, is a small bus that um, is not fully accessible, and it is our van. Um, but in full transparency, um, twice in the last week, Michelle has come to me and said, Steve, is it time to take a look at the small bus? Because it seems like it is taking an awful lot of repair. And that's always, just like with our own vehicles, when do you stop putting good money in and when do you stop replacing? Um, we're considering asking our bus transportation company to give it a full, complete analysis and give it to them, uh, see if their mechanic can take a look at it and what we need to do. Um, but right now it's planning to replace an FY21, but it's had a difficult year. That's our vehicle replacement trust. Tax rate stabilization fund, Article 10, this was found in March of 2012, and this is allowed, this was a change in the state law that uh, the Hampshire ASMO uh, testified for, and I believe Michelle did as well. This allows the hobby of school entities to put money away to stabilize the tax rate. The, um, the, the 2.5% of net assessment, this year it's at $331,000. Um, we have, and, and what Michelle and I put together for the revenue is a very ish rough. We fully, fully understand that the board can go up, <coughs> down, left, right, whatever the board wants to do. But it is uh, 150,000 out of this to, see, to reduce the tax rate, and you know, the most we could put in this is 375,000 um, dollars. So this allows us, if we have unreserved fund balance, we can place it here. And obviously, trying to stabilize the tax rate has been a board's goal for a, as long as I've been working here. So what does this mean? So, uh, so I apologize for this one, and the board, actually, I'll this um, So there's two different scenarios coming around of the board. So again, as I introduce this concept, so there's two different scenarios for revenue. So how does, how does revenue work? Um, there's local revenue. And um, Michelle and, and, uh, and I worked together in trying to reconfigure, make sure we had enough room for food service. So we increased the food service revenue by 114000 There's also state revenue. Increased uh, special ed aid, about $70,000. And we've increased in adequacy about $200,000. Um, we've also Remember last year, as Dave spoke uh, about, is we got a, a public infrastructure grant about 300, uh, it was 80, 20 national. So our revenue was down about 317,000. We didn't get that grant again. Um, our federal program grant, uh, we, we, we reallocated, so that's down about 280. Um, we're transferring from the maintenance trust about 34,000. That's less than we did last year. That's uh, already, the board can certainly raise that if they want. We transfer from the tax rate stabilization fund 150,000. 
So overall, Michelle, right, the revenue is about even from last year to this year. So we move things around, and like we added 150. If I added 200 thousand dollars in tax rate stabilization, our, our, our revenue would have gone down. If we did 100 thousand, um, we would have needed it more. So last week. I talked about about a two million dollar increase in the budget, a million of which is facilities. If that all goes in the budget, we are looking at a three dollar and forty cent increase to your tax rate. That's a million dollars of roofs and all that work, not bonded, not spread out over time, but just all satisfied this year. That would be obviously the most significant investment in facilities we've made um, in years. We also put together a scenario, what if we took that $1 million out and either bonded it or did something else, and now that rate is, a, uh, I wonder if I, did I, is this, did I adjust that based on the pay? It's $1.76, so it's close? Yeah. So it's $1.76 on the tax rates. So just so you're with me, so, all the facilities gets hit one year, it's 340. The facility comes out, it's $1.76. Um, I'm gonna go through, when we get back to the general fund, and I'm going to talk about staffing changes that I've already made based on transitions from last week to this week. Um, also, full transparency, there's $49,999 for food service, and that is connected. So we, uh, budget, we cover, try and cover food service from the revenue within food service, and anything that we don't cover has to come out of the unreserved fund balance. And there's been years and years and years now of build up and pressure on the unreserved fund balance. And so when the board talks about returning 500,000, that could be after having, uh, paying off the deficit for food service. So this is our, our scenarios that I fully expect and understand how the board will ask for revisions to the expenditure side and, of course, the revenue side, taking a look at either the 340 or the 176. But this is based on an adjusted superintendent's budget, including the tank out and some staffing I'll get to. We've reduced some staffing in the last week. Questions for me before? <coughs> Questions about revenue. And practicing wait time. Dave. Yeah, thanks, Steve. So I don't have a question so much about revenue as I do just sort of the, um, the tax impact calculation. So I know it's been our practice to hold the, um, the uh, town net valuation the same as the prior year, just so you can compare apples to apples. Are we we're doing that this year too? Did we go up a little? This is the new value, so, so we don't have another value that comes out, I believe, until okay. the NS one is done. Okay. Which is next year. Okay. Um, so that is um, correct me if I'm wrong. I think maybe Jim knows a little bit more, but September-ish, I think, for the um, property values. I believe so. Or, uh, but anyways, that. it's in that vicinity. <laughs> Yeah. Um, because it's due um, right before we have to have everything else done to actually set the tax rate. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, 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 generally, you don't you don't expect to be a, there to be a large fluctuation on there. But did the town do some reassessment work? This it's past? up three million. Yeah, it's, it's up to three million. Okay, so it's not. It's I wouldn't. Not significant. I wouldn't adjust All right, it. Great. All right. Good. Thank you, Steve. I just want to make sure I'm following you because sure. my eyes aren't what they used to be in. I don't have this in front of me. So the 340, I think that's what I'm seeing. Yes. Is a presentation of what you gave us last week and the summary slide from the expense budget. If we did the 11, what was it like a, almost a 12% increase? That would be the 340 hit to the tax rate. Correct. Okay. And Minus then a little bit of adjustment tanks out and some staff yeah. out. Right. And then the other one, the uh, 176 is the six and a half percent increase that you presented minus some things that you've taken out that we haven't seen yet so, so well no the, no the what's taken out 
are in the, all the facility stuff, the roofs. That yeah. One point yeah. So it's it's minus. So it's it's the six and a half percent increase that you presented last week, right? Because you presented us to you gave us a summary of the operating budget, Correct. which is six the and a half. Non capital. In non capital. Okay. You and then, you are then right that on. plus the capital. Okay. So okay. the one seventy six is the what was a six and a half percent budget increase minus some things that you've taken out that we haven't seen yet would then be the one seven six. Am I following that? Yes. Because okay. the, you'll see a bond on the darker orange. That's where. That's how I cap, that captured. That's cool. Not necessarily that it would be a bond, like Steve was talking about, but it's just taken so, out of it. Yeah. yeah. I got so you. it adds it up as revenue. And so then the other question, since we're talking about expenses, we asked last week to get a breakdown, a spreadsheet of, of all the expenses that were as included. Is that available? So. Um, uh, we're going we're to give you a, a revised big spreadsheet, and I uh, have the staffing completely done. Uh, okay. And we're going to go through all the staffing. I'm still working on the other documents. Okay. And we don't have, you don't have a handout for us for this presentation? Um, I was going to do that as we get to the uh, discussion, but you can have whatever you'd like. If you have one, that'd be great. It's just hard to take so, notes and try to follow through. Uh, uh, the presentation. Uh, I'm sorry. No, the slides, I didn't produce Okay. Slides. That's fair. Thank you. Other questions? I just have a quick question on tuition. Um, those, so those are the tuitioned in students that, that we have currently? Tuition and preschool. And preschool, thank you. That was the question. So Steve, just sort of finger in the air. If, um, if you were looking at, at pulling the million out of OPEX and put it into a, 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 a capital bond, Obviously, you don't have payment on the capital bond in the first year, so it would not be there would right. not be an FY20 debt service. So that would be FY21 on a million bucks. So what's, I've got um, what's that? I, I've got a, a five-year bond and a three-year bond. I got a three million dollar in a five-year, um, but we might be able to get you just a, a million dollars. So yeah. um, I don't have a million dollar payment right now. But I do, and so uh, what I no, no, I didn't mean a single year million dollar panel. No, no, it's going to no. be the million bucks. So, but but yeah, yeah. But what what yeah? If we're spread over five years, um, that would be thirty cents a year. Yeah, I mean you've got two hundred thousand I mean, plus. Cents a year. I don't know, is one hundred thousand sixteen thirty cents so thirty five thirty seven cents? It's so something like that. Okay, that fit, just for a finger in the air. Yeah. yeah. All right. Questions about revenue, about where you want to be out of t uh, tax rate stabilization, maintenance trust, if you want to take a look at deploying significant questions. The next piece is the budget discussion, which will break down some of the increases, um, specifically the, the staffing, where we are there. If the board can decide on do they want to see a, a zero increase, a dollar increase, or whatever you'd like, we can work on that in the next week. Um, one of the things that we've done, so there is some uncertainty in some of the projections. Um, for example, we don't, we have 64 kids in kindergarten this year we are projected, we don't know if we're going to need three or four kindergartens, and we don't know how many third grades are going to need. Um, we have 64 kids. It's projected, as I talked about last week. What we did this year, and it seemed to be effective, is we split the difference and, and used a contingency fund about $100,000. We did pull the trigger on, uh, on <coughs> kindergarten because kindergarten went out. So if the board wants to consider using a contingency fund, because one of the issues is if we, if we are cutting to fund a second, uh, an additional second grade, or keeping, I should say, the second grade, and it doesn't come to fruition, we have eliminated some programs without necessarily needing it. So that's, I think, our last two years we've used a strategy to leverage and hedge against some of these unknowns with at least a piece of the contingency fund. Um, so if the board wants to uh, direct me to look at that strategy, we can do that. And then, if you would like next week, in December 20, what if FY20 was reduced by? What would that look like in the Hopkins School District? What, um, what do board members have some any feedback for Steve? I mean, I, I think on the contingency fund that has worked well for us the last two years, and I would say we should 
look at that again. Okay, so when I where we're at bring back some of the typically what we've done is a tier zero, something I've already cut already. And then what is moved to the reduction, but moving I usually put moved to the contingency or at least a portion of it. And then use it, see how see how that goes. Would you probably put those two classrooms in contingency? Um, I, this year, Michelle and I was talking about a two hundred thousand dollar contingency and seeing what we would put in there. Yeah. And um, we typically we've done a fifty percent share, mm -hmm. so one of those. So mm -hmm. hundred thousand there. Um, depending on what you want to do with unreserved fund balance, the concern is, and, and this is what started to happen. So last year was the first year we froze the budget first week of January. We have a savvy staff that cares deeply about their program. We I think we froze the budget three. Two out of the last three or three out of the last four. So what we saw this year is some staff members in September completely expend their funds because they believe that Steve's going to freeze the budget again and I care about my program so much. So that's the piece. If we freeze the budget, if, if the unreserved fund balance is high and we got to cover the food service piece, um, that all goes into that fact. So we were looking at at least allocating some pieces of the contingency to food service and we're leaving some pressure on the unreserved fund balance tax rate balance it's harder but um, we serve it the pleasure but that certainly that can go into the strategy as we start take a look at what does a different you know what does a different budget look like because there's certainly significant pressure on this budget anything else i mean at this point i mean offering steve some guidance um as to how to take a look at um, the budget is very helpful for him and also for us as we right. move to next week. What would be your thoughts and um, guidance to give to Steve on exactly how we want to ask him to come back? And take a look at. I mean, I think having those breakdowns at different tiers prioritized based on you know educational impact would be helpful. We've developed a rubric um, to classify each reduction based on educational impact, safety, um, or risk. Risk. Yeah. 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 Happy to use that. So you know, I've I've never been uh, you know a huge fan of um, of budget freezes, but but I think probably more than half the years of been on this board we've we've had them yeah. um, and uh, and so they're a necessary part of I think um, you know financial um, management and um, if that's becoming less effective um, then I don't know if there's any way through the um, through the, the financial system that that you can you can put sort of like spend down um, um, dates or something like that like when a when somebody has a budget for for supplies that that you know throughout the whole year that it doesn't necessarily get depleted on September 1st but there's a, a, a spend down plan or something like that that so come January it could get frozen if it has to and it gives you a little more flexibility um, I appreciate you know that. I, I, I but it gives close. you gives you off budget flexibility I think we're close um, Michelle and I did take a look at the budget process how much was encumbered and how much was spend this year and there were some accounts that were 100 percent yeah. spent before and there's, there's no judgment they care deeply about that oh absolutely and, and i'm not and i'm not i'm not making a judgment on it you right. know i'm, I'm just, just making, I'm i get it it's just, just we've had a couple of years of unanticipated expenses right, that right. impacted everything we do well i mean we've we, you know you know you, you, we can't anticipate everything in this business because what do we say i mean we're making this 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 budget 20 months before um before some of these dollars are even being spent, so. I have a quick question on the on the um, transportation trust. Um, so um, I believe I saw that we have what twenty six thousand in there right now, and you were suggesting that we recommending that we put another fifteen in, but that there is some concern about the small bus. What would be the sh so even 15 more in there would not cover the 50 to replace it? 
what would be the short-term plan if all of a sudden that thing tanked in the next 12 months? Yeah, if, um, is it possible to obtain one that has come off off lease, maybe with less miles and a little bit better maintenance history than ours? Okay. There is always, we can continually to repair. So 50K would be if we replaced it with something brand new? Okay. Or we can look at a lease. Okay. Um, a different so there are options. Purchase. We're not we're not putting ourselves in a situation where we could be. Um, and, and that is a significant part of the program. Um, academic program, co curricular program. Mm -hmm. um, our ELO, Extended Learning Opportunities Program, our um, science programs, um, they use the bus Because originally I had put a, a lease payment amount in the budget for transportation and that was cut by Steve. So that okay. 15K represents what? What would you get if you had that additional 15K in? That's 15K? Is that, 15, that's 15, the, 44. Yeah, you add an additional 15. Right, recurrent. Is that so covering that's, repair? That'd be 44. Yeah, so in the trust. We don't in the usually trust. use yeah. the vehicle repair yeah. uh, or okay. a repair only okay. because um, we try to not put too much in because of we have a lot of areas that we do need to cover. So um, we try to absorb that as much as we can in the budget, um, unless it's astronomical, and then that's a different. Yeah, the whole idea was to build that trust up to get to Correct. a point where we could replace a vehicle okay. after a certain number of years of what was considered to be useful life of those vehicles. So we didn't have to spend 50000 yep. out of a contingency fund for a bus. Um, any other any comments for Steve at, at this point? And I think we need to make a recommendation in terms of what we want him to Sure. Look at for next Thursday. Yeah, so you'll go ahead and maybe propose something on that, Liz. But mm -hmm. but just in terms of, and, and I, I think Steve's heading in this direction on it, but just on the um, on the uh, capital projects, repair and maintenance, and other planned, um, you know, scheduled maintenance items, uh, you know, I am a big fan of, uh, of, of bonding that, or maybe said another way, I'm not a big fan of, of spending all in one year on that um, because uh, people reap the benefit. Our residents reap the benefit for that over five years, six years, 10 years. And, and so it should be spread out over time because you don't know how long people are gonna, you know, any, any one given family may remain in town either. So, um, so spending a little bit while, you know, every year while it's. Uh, right, not, I mean, it may sound contradicting, but I guess people would say that not having a bond puts a place too much pressure on current residents, it doesn't make yeah. your tax pay. Right, right. I, mean, I remember when Dr. Harris came back and said, you know, we are actually under bonded at a time of trying to make sure that we're doing everything we could to spread out the payments throughout the entire tax. Right, so as people move out, as people move in, they all contribute a little bit to what their, um, the benefits they're receiving. When I talk to a bond person who lives in town, um, not having any bond makes us a very appealing client. Good luck. Mm -hmm. Right, depending on the value, we have multiple avenues that we can do that would be cheaper. Whereas, you know, a larger one, it's really only the bond bank that you really have mm -hmm. for That's the right. mechanism. Yeah. Whereas a smaller amount, like three to five million, you can piece it. So you can get approval for up to five, oh. and you can start working on like a million. You know, you can just have it worded the way it what? is so that it is over a couple years so that you can get smaller loans and actually the local banks, you know, we go up to bid and all that. Is that how you and do that's roads? what the town's been doing um, with our last few is we've been doing private lenders because you get better rates than you have at the bond bank as well. Um, so I think that it, um, I guess Steve, that, that what might be helpful for us uh, for next week is to take a look at what it would, what we would look like if we did three tiers. Um, of reductions that would be, um, you know, approximately, because um, I know that there are things that sort of fall into various buckets and cross lines and things like that, but approximately um, a reduction of 300, a reduction of 600, a reduction of 900,000. So that would um, basically be three slices sure. of the budget um, from what we're looking at over last week and tonight, and if anybody else has any feedback, and that's, operate, on, that's, operating that's operating expense. Budget, that's right. not capital, correct? Correct. So it just be operating expenses. Um, gives us time to really think about how the, the, the you know the, the capital expenses are going to fit into um, that puzzle, if you will, and consider all the options that we have sort of out on the table right now um, for how to um, how to handle those um, going forward. Um, does anybody else have any other feedback for Steve based on my recommendation? 
No, I guess it's just a question. So, and I know it's in here somewhere. So, what's the percent in tax rate? It's a hundred thousand. No. To get it. You mean what is one percent? Yeah. I see you rattled that off. One percent on the budget. On the operating budget. Yeah, that's right. Um, about two hundred thousand. Yeah. Okay. And what are the numbers you put out? Three, six, and nine. Okay. Yeah. That, yeah. So ish, like so ish, ish, yeah, ish, yeah, yeah, depending yeah. on what his tiers are. Um, obviously, I mean. So leadership team will put together. Um, what does the first three hundred look out? The next three hundred look, and the next three hundred plus nine hundred thousand dollars. And Jim, I apologize. What are, are there specific areas you would like me to unpack about the increases? I'm going to do staffing for you. I think I did facilities. I've done technology. Yeah, I think the request is. You know, there's so the. PowerPoint you gave us yeah. was helpful in sort of an outline, but it's hard to look at it's hard to look at individual costs because they're not sort of listed out. And so I think Matt and I were both just hoping to get a spreadsheet that would just outline where the expenses were because there there's some of them are in here and some of them aren't, and so it's just hard to you know some of them are smaller and you said you didn't include them in there, but it's just helpful to know. Like so, and do you want to, any increase at all? Well, I, I'm just looking for what you presented. So I guess okay. what you presented to us last week, not all the numbers are in here and they're hard to uh, I, I, I'll, 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 No, it's all right. I'll unpack that for you. You're talking about like FTEs? I'm just so looking at, I, yeah, I guess I'm just looking at what, what you presented to us in mm -hmm. terms of our, what you're presenting as a budget. There's no backup. I don't have any backup material in which to look at. So it would just be helpful to have. Whatever you're looking at would be helpful to see. Okay. And I, I hope what I present and I do now, um, all the backup for the least staff meeting. Um, and I will do that now. So, um, coming around is um, so this memo takes a look at all the current, and I went through from what so this goes from what I presented last week to where we are this week. And I'll try to uh, clean some stuff up, clarify some stuff, and um, the number in, in this this budget evolves as we learn more and dig deeper. Um, so the first piece, I'm going to take a look at Harold Martin. So currently there are four sections of uh, kindergarten, first grade, and um, second grade, and three sections of third grade. Did you get that right? Correct. Look at that. I rarely get that one. So, and this is where it's kind of funky. So we have 82 kids in second grade. We know we're going to need, I, I don't think there's much question about needing four third grades. So there's an increase in this budget of another third grade, and that's an $1,100, and that's $100,000. The question on this is, do we have four second grades? And of course, are we going to have four kindergartens? Four kindergartens, we've seen regular growth. And, and there was, last year, there was more question there. This year, it's, it's, it's more stable. But again, it is a question. But the, the question for Bill and I is to look at second grade based on 64 kids. If it's 64 kids moving um, to third grade, we're comfortable. With three, that takes care of the facility issue this year, and that takes care of $100,000. It's projected to be over 70. We've had lots of projections um, at 71, so that's the issue. But right now, four third grades and four second grades. It's a four across the board, which puts more facility pressure on Harold. Um, but we, that is not a sure thing. I do believe the 82, for example, is a sure thing. You with me? The 64 is not a sure thing. Preschool. I spent a lot of time with Becky and Bill talking about where we are in preschool. So um, <coughs> preschool runs a Monday, Wednesday, Friday morning program, a Tuesday, Thursday morning program, a Monday, Wednesday, Friday afternoon program, and expects to need a Tuesday, Thursday afternoon program next year. So right now, and, and we have 22 students already enrolled, we see significant growth um, some by uh, regulation and some just by movements and some by people deciding on it. So it will not be surprised us at all to get to 30, 35 youngsters. So we need a special ed teacher and a regular ed teacher. This increase of 0.4 would give us a full-time regular ed teacher, a full-time special ed teacher while including a coordinator position. A preschool is unique in that you, have, you, can, you coordinate with the local agencies, you do home visits, you do a lot of assessments as kids come in, so there really is a coordinator role. So because uh, this position is shared between preschool, sorry, regular ed and special ed, this increase is shared between 1100 and 1200 and it's about $22,000. Um, and um, 
So we average about 15, 16 kids a session, a uh, little over three, a little less than five year olds um, with related service and some significant. So we really do need an increased staff here. So that's 22, 8, 1100, 1200. Maple. Uh, the fourth grade um, is currently, in, so we are going from a three in grade three to a four in grade four. One of the reasons why we're doing that is there is projected growth. Um, another uh, a piece that we're going here is that uh, Amy did a deep dive into the data and where we are and, and how we're going to best meet the services of, of these wonderful young people and believe that the most efficient and the best way to to catch up some and to support high quality instruction and with the growth is to add a fourth grade. Um, and that is uh, 1100 function, about $100,000. And connected to this is an increase in literacy and I appreciate the passion plea about literacy and reading. As the board knows in my 10 years though I was trained as a math teacher, and actually so was Amy. Um, you know, though we're both numeracy focused people, no one can argue the importance of reading. And so uh, Amy did an analysis of where we are and really believes that with uh, one uh, more additional day support of reading, uh, fourth grade is a critical time. Between third and fourth grade, we want kids to identify themselves as readers. If by the time you leave fourth grade, you identify yourself as a reader, you're much more apt to read be successful in school and actually access services because you're not a reader. If we don't get them by that time, it's much harder. So this is really an efficient way to early intervene in reading. And when you have a, what we've learned over the last few years with an increasing demand, having a four-day staff member versus five disrupts uh, the consistency of the program. So we gain consistency with a great targeted accelerated growth. We will be targeting youngsters who really need it. Um, I appreciate uh, spending time with Chris uh, today and taking a look at we are uh, withdrawing, I am withdrawing from the superintendent's budget, reduce the world language, digging in, we think we can just reallocate and move that. So there is that is a reduction of 17000 from the superintendent's budget based on the numbers that Chris and I are, are willing to defend the reallocation versus an addition. Uh, just backing up for a second to the, uh, oh, the literacy part. Yes. Um, I missed one too. I yeah, missed today, yeah. But um, uh, is there any, and I may be getting this wrong, Title I, are there any federal funds? Uh, not for that. Position. Not for that. Not for that at all, even the, even the uh, for the point eight that are. Harold Mark is our Title I. Harold Mark, right. right. So it doesn't, uh, right. Okay. And I apologize for this. So that's 24000 from the 1100 fund. Yep. And then. Um, the, the wellness piece, by adding a, there is a connection, by adding, this is the first time I think we've done a 20th. Mm -hmm. I've done a lot of 10th in my life, this is the 20th. Uh, the, this, the, con, the collective bargaining agreement actually dictates the number of special classes and dictates how many are a certain uh, percentage. And by adding one more, we bump up to a, a, a 20th increase at about $3,000. Again, middle school is out, high school, I think, um, where we are, projected enrollment is 35, uh, and 35 is an Hopkins in a two section. Uh, we haven't had a class size of world language of 35 in my history in Hopkins in 20 years. Um, so that's so now we had um, this year, and part of our reserve was some funds in the budget for world language that we didn't need, but it's still there. So we are simply adding a tenth to combine for this fit. Careers, as you can see, we have, uh, if we don't add to our careers class, we, we're going from a class size of 30 to 22 and a half um, a career. So there are 90 students who will take careers, and that typically for us is a four section versus a three section. That's 18,000, that's also, that's 2120, which is a guidance function, right, Michelle? That's a guidance area. English, 17 more students would, is, is a, an increase of a fifth, but we have a tenth unused in our budget this year. So that reduces class size from 24.25 to 19.4. A 20, pretty close to a 20 class size for an English is uh, uh, much more typical. One of the things I also want to uh, come out, I know Chris would say this with Rebecca, averages are never averages. 
there are peaks and there are values. So if you had an average of 25, you would have a class of 30 and a class of 20. You know, because it never works out perfect because we believe in voice and choice and as we talked about last week, motivational theory. So though we have an average, um, in a class, if we have an average of 19.5, we'd not be surprised if we have a 24, but we probably won't have a 30. If we go with a 25, it's possible we have a 30. You would be here against me. You're picking up what I'm looking at. Uh, math, um, we thought we, we can do this with just one additional section of geometry. As you heard about last week, this year we're running three geometries. We like to heavy lo uh, load geometry more in the fall in preparation for SATs. And that thing, uh, Chris and Rebecca, we think we can, if we just, and so geometry is a semester course. So we think we can squeeze this down to just a geometry section, and that would be $1,114,000. Science, uh, we have 20 youngsters moving into a chemistry area and 37 in a general physics area. They all won't take them, but we think um, the, based on our past analysis of growth and the hard cap in science, that that warrants a two-section increase. Social studies, like uh, sophomore year, it's 17 students. That's a class size from 22 to 18. Um, that is a fifth, $1,115,000 for that fifth. Civics, uh, without the additional section, we'd be averaging at tw almost 25. With it, we're at 18.5. Civics uh, is a graduation requirement, um, so we're needed another section there. PE is an average of 25 right now, so we have some high and some are lower. We have 21 more students to enroll in physical education classes. Uh, that could move uh, average class to 27, which means we could be average over 30. Um, to be completely transparent, <coughs> physical education is typically where you do absorb those plus 30 classes. Without a doubt, you'll see all of these on a tier, right? Some will be at a higher tier and some will be at a lower tier. But I also want to respect and value all content areas that if there's a subject matter with a 25 and within 21 kids, it goes in a budget. It's not survival budget. But it certainly it's known that that's what we're working. So I'm certainly not embarrassed by that if I understand how physical education is. Would you say this year the number of increases we need has been more significant than prior years? Just Going forward? Enrollment yes. Up, and this, this is probably the new look of yeah, our enrollment, we're, we're getting close to our all-time high. We had 63 new students this year, and from first grade to, to 12th grade, and that's now our third consecutive year of big growth. And, um, but we don't know. Um, we, you know, our big entry years, um, seventh grade, ninth grade, you know, those tend to grow because that's when you start. Um, but yeah, we're growing, and that's why you saw an increase of adequacy of $200,000. Um, that is based on average daily membership, which has grown because of this. You know, it's also interesting, too. I mean, I'm sure you saw the, the headlines um, last week that, um, that uh, I think it was like either New Hampshire, Fis New Hampshire fiscal policy, um, but uh, uh, the um, uh, net um, increase in, 20, in, in essentially the 20 to 30-year-old, um, um, uh, 20 to 30-year-olds in New Hampshire has increased every year since 2014. Oh, so wow. it's been a, a net positive. People mm -hmm. that that study uh, had not been understood, and um, uh, and so that's uh, that's certainly something that I'm sure will get factored in on future um, enrollment trends. Bill and I didn't get the chance to chat, but I had the privilege of attending the second and third grade holiday concert this week, and I try to do it every year. I've never seen so many babies. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't, there were a lot of, in the audience, and I'm not trying to be melodramatic about it, but I don't know if you, but there was a lot of babies that come in. I mean, maybe some of the towns come to watch, yeah. but typically in the town. Um, so I, I will take a look at my presentation and unpack even more of the other areas, Jim. I will do that. That's great. But hopefully this gives you an idea really of where helpful. we are on staffing. Um, and yeah. facilities, I think we've done pretty well, but I'll hit the other areas. Uh, special ed. Um, Becky and I have talked about it. Really is connected to uh, district contracting services down, but I'll give you more information. Any questions for Steve on this? So I think I've got my marching orders. I've got my tiers. Uh, so T I E R S T E A R S. Actually, I'll have both. Yeah, both. Um, <laughs> then I just so, and I appreciate. It. I think we've already addressed this. But when we look at a sample warrant, 
the board is not opposed to looking at a contingency fund as part of that right. menu. Uh, I wanted to check that. In school board schedule, I just want to do a quick check-in. Um, based on, you've been inundated now, really, for five meetings with so much information. Um, should, in, in my world, are we looking at a January 3rd final decision or a December 20th final? There's no judgment here. I'm just trying to get the board's head. I'm going to do my best to give you all information. But a, a, a final decision January 3rd for the board budget? I mean, I think so. That's just my opinion. I think we'll probably need another so meeting too. and then come back for a final. Yeah. Perfect. I just yeah. wanted to get that out there now. Um, are you okay? Yes. The, um, Where we've been on the facility project in the last week, um, we had the last um, November 29th, where we looked at um, um, Jay came, um, Dan Bison came from Harriman, and there were some open questions regarding the, the, the maintenance um, and. I very much appreciate Jane's continued communication with Harriman and Billy, Bill Bruce, our facility director. So, um, if you were just to bring you back, a couple open questions I had about the $274,000 of HVAC. Right? That I worked with Siemens and took a look at temperatures and where we are, and they had a chance to walk the building. What Siemens has done is Siemens has communicated with the engineers at Harriman uh, saying that the, through this appliance, through this, this is how much square foot of air circulation we get. And if that is adequate, when Harriman does the, uh, the analysis of the square footage of the case in that area, then we can eliminate that 274. So they are working on it. Harriman and Simons has done their part. I'm hoping that we can eliminate that 274. We have enough air circulation per student in that area of the building. Um, one thing we can take off, and I'll have this more next week as I continually go through, is there was a 50, 000, I think a $51,000 look at Harriman for um, sprinkler heads. We took a look at that and we think we have an in-house uh, approach that we can eliminate that $51,000 on the sprinkler heads. Um, all the doors were looked at and the inside fire doors and that, so we do need some door work that can't come out. Um, that is uh, uh, something that we're trying to drill down, but we cannot eliminate indoor work because there's too many fire doors and too much apparatus that have to work. So that continues. Um, I did, as I said, after talking with Liz and taking a look at, do we want to look at a maintenance of, or a deferred maintenance uh, bond? And the deferred maintenance Where we are, if the board wanted to, and it just just a, a six million dollar bond for five years at three percent is a two dollars and eight cents on the tax rate. Okay, so that would be six million in five years. That's obviously a huge hit, but that was a number. The other one that we looked at was a six million. Uh, uh, sorry, a. $3 million uh, five-year bond was about a dollar. So three, if you wanted to take a look at catching up with $3 million, have that bond, that would be a dollar. So on the, um, uh, on the, the, the big ticket items for that, for, the, for that bond to cover the roofs, is that it? Yeah, this, would, this $3 million would take care of the, the first few years of the CIA. Okay, and then and then, what's the uh, what's the life expectancy of those? I mean, just sort of roughly. Oh, over ten. Okay. Well, yeah. Okay. Do you think you can get through the first three years of what was on the CIP? Uh, I can certainly bring that back next week and yeah. talk with Bill and Michelle to dig in, see how far that would take mm -hmm. us. 
And we can also get from the bond bank who wanted a million dollars just to take a look. They're really good. Bond banks. They run a lot of tables. Um, a bond bank or private? Yeah, I was going to say, can you get some private rates? Because sure. I'm assuming the private rates are going to be cheaper than bond bank rates. Actually, yeah, I can go up. Um, Sure. Thank you. I can see that. I mean, see the difference. I'll do a one-three. You know, maybe one-three yeah, five million dollars. Well, you got them on the phone. Yeah. Say again for me. Do a one million, a three million, and a five million dollar. For how many? Five years. Five, and maybe just ask them for five and ten. You just got to it. Get, Thank you. Just to get some numbers. Happy to bring that back next week. Spring coolers. Just door. Yeah. That's what I have. That's it for the update on the project. So more bonds and trying to uh, more bond scenarios and trying to uh, see uh, go through. I'll go through the um, deferred maintenance and see where we are in eliminating and where we are back in trying to get that a harder number for you as we go, based on the feedback from Harriman and Steve. Does that sound all right? Mm -hmm. Anything else for Steve for his list? Okay. Everyone's okay? Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, next to the underground storage tank, we had the public hearing. Um, everybody all said you have what you need to take the two action items. One is to draw the contract, the other is to award the contract. Mm -hmm. Everyone felt that? After um, the last piece, after last week's discussion and a continued discussions with Michelle, I am uh, uh, very comfortable in awarding the Hopkins School District Transportation contract for a student. That would be the continuation of our vendor based on driver availability. They are also, I had a chance to meet with their contract manager, they're adding a potential service to special ed transportation, which may save us some money going forward. Um, so I think with that potential of savings in relationships and understanding of both companies, uh, their company and us, I think we can comfortably award the contract any questions for Steve on that? And it's an action item tonight as well. Yeah, that's an action item. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so just sort of, I know I've been sort of doing the Larry Donahue thing, so I'm pushing back on, <laughs> on things um, tonight. But but just in the facility project, and also based on some of the comments I think we heard, there were, there was there was um, I, I think some supportive comments to the effect that the four hundred thousand uh, dollars investment in um, in safety and security uh, throughout the district would be uh, w has gone a long way to to satisfy safety and security concerns I certainly don't think that that's nearly as as um, comprehensive as as what um, you know you know moving the uh, the main entrance and, and things like that do for safety and security but if we do head in that direction um, uh, I would I would certainly want to see the district move towards having a comprehensive school uh, safety policy yeah. and something that we don't have presently um, to to dovetail with the work that's 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 being done and, and with a lot of it having been done already yeah, I, I appreciate that Dave the, there's the Three components to this, right? There's the hardening of schools, which we've done through uh, airlock systems and through uh, monitoring entrance. There's a social emotional component that we're trying to work on with uh, Santa Promise, mm -hmm. the Say Hello, some other work, responsive classroom. And then there's what actually, what policies can we put in place to help people feel safe and productive right. in our, our right. building? And you know, last year around the March meeting, you know, people came forward. I think some students came forward, some others came forward about can the board put policies in place to make people feel safe. Coming? Yeah, and that's what I'm talking about when I talk about a, a comprehensive school safety uh, policy. And and to the extent that has budget impacts, we need to be we need to be aware of, of that as well. So happy uh, happy to take a look and see what other districts are doing and see what um, what policies we can place to ensure that our workers and our students. Employees, and staff, faculty, staff, employees feel safe, and productive in school. Um, that you know certainly is something that um, I appreciated when they said our asset is our, our teachers. I would uh, I always expand that to include administrators and everybody because I love them. Thank you. <laughs> I love them all. That that was not safe. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Um, but uh, making sure everybody feels safe, and productive. I mean, can we put it in policy in place? I think that's our due diligence. Okay. Thank you. 
um, just moving back like Dave did, I'll, I'll stick with them. Um, you know, something I've been thinking a bit about is the accessibility at the middle high school, um, something I spoke about before. And I know one option that we have right now is to do the back entrance, which would improve accessibility. I don't, maybe I'm wrong, I just don't get a lot of um, sense that the $8 million for that back entrance is going to be part of a proposal. Maybe it is, but my sense is not. And so I'm, I'm just trying to think through if we are going to do a facility project. It seems like we know that's an issue, so student accessibility. Um, and I'm just, right now the option that we have is an $8 million or $8.5 million option. We don't really have anything else that's been presented to us that kind of gets us a little bit closer. And, you know, Don's comments today um, got me thinking, um, you know, we have a real problem that we know about. And it seems like, you know, kind of looking at Jay, if there's another solution or something else that we could think about tweaking at the middle high school um, while we're thinking about what our approach is here on facilities that may start to address that, that's not an $8.5 million dollar solution because it's important we know it's an issue um, it seems like a, a fairness thing to our students who have to you know, go through what they go through um, and it'd be something I like to see a little bit more work done on I know it's not a lot of time but I assume the steering committees probably looked at this every which way they could and it'd be good to see other options I'm happy to work with Jay and, and, and Dan and Mark Lee from Harriman to see can a component can we make it better you know can we take a look at that classroom we take a look at some of the other real deficiencies in a, in a different cost approach. Um, and, and I, you know, Jay has always trained me to be very careful about splitting things off because they hand in glove and all that. I, I honestly, I don't think at this point it would be realistic to have a, a number that I'd be comfortable standing behind between now and your as you get into the decisions on what this project will entail. Um, it's to, to pull that. That part of it, there's a, there's a lot of elements of that that we specifically tried to package together to, to meet both the safety and security issues that were, were addressed by having the staffed entrance and also incorporating the accessibility. As you start to pull those out, it, it makes it kind of tricky to say what that would actually be. Um, we could do a fairly simple square footage takeoff, but it, sometimes if you, if you want it bad, you get it bad. So I'd be a little hesitant to say I could give you a number between now and the next couple of weeks. It's going to be that'll hold up to the light of day. But it's certainly something that could be looked at. Um, my guess is, is all things being equal, a lot of that that eight million dollars was in the construction. Um, the construction's about twice as much as the renovation. So um, that's really kind of a, a wild guess. But to give you an idea of scope, what would, what would it entail? That would be. I think that would be a fair way to, to at least get an order of magnitude there. But I think even um, you know even taking a look, and I think Don uh, did a did a good job to articulate it. Um, I mean, e even if we were to do something like like, and I'm not suggesting this, take that classroom offline, then a student wouldn't be exiting into a, a classroom. It would be a more standard experience, um, and um, and uh, you know I don't think we've got the you know, classroom availability to take that classroom online, uh, you take that classroom offline, but possibly making it smaller, um, putting a wall, separate entrance exit, something like that. If, if something like that um, could work with the existing elevator setup, then, uh, then rather than, um, rather than taking the, um, you know, the $8 million plan and saying, well, we're not going to be able to, to do that entrance plan, and so we're going to leave the, um, the access the way it is. If there is a, and I hate to use the term, but it is the term, you know, a Band-Aid type of solution uh, for that, that improves the student experience, makes it a little more fair, and, and we can yeah. fold it in to capital improvement or something like this then you know I'm just also thinking like we know the ramp in the cafeteria is not adequate like it doesn't meet standards and that just seems like a failing um, you know I feel like the school district's failing our students when we we know there's a ramp that just isn't meeting the needs that it's supposed to be designed for so again and just thinking about what are those accessibility things we can talk about that might get factored yeah I'm not sure that ramp yeah I, 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 I should clarify that that is actually that is, oh, that is. Okay. Yeah, there I heard was, in a presentation it wasn't. Yeah, there was a couple of pieces that were mixed up on that. The reason we looked at oh, that's good to know. That's yeah, the ramp is not the old not ramp. the current ramp is not. Which, oh, okay. the, the current ramp is not a handicap accessible. My understanding is yeah. that it is. I, I was I, I when I was principal, I had the disability of people come in. 
they took out their measure. They said it was not the right depth. Okay, so that's obviously no, that would be a good thing to know. That'd be a good thing to know. <laughs> I was, I was, I was told okay. by that by the disabilities people came in and did the system. Yeah. Well, that's okay. what I remember you saying that. And there was no handicap accessibility to parking out there. So yeah, it wasn't really intended. I don't know what it was. Intended. Yeah, that, that's what I'm questioning. What, right. what it was really intended for to begin with. But, but improving the elevator access would at least provide a more standard experience for the, for the entire street. So again, when we, when we looked at that option, it, it included additional space that was built at, the, at what's currently the back that would, be, it would allow the current administration's space to be repurposed to make up for the space we lose. So if we don't do that, we're, we're losing space somewhere. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah. just... It, it, the, it, it's, it's certainly a decision that could be made, but the, sometimes everything cascades a little bit when you, if you do that, then where does that extra classroom go? Uh, we had the ability to, to accommodate that in the space that's current, the current administration space, but if we don't move the, the administrators, then uh, that room will have to be made up somewhere, and I, I don't know right. programmatically how that could be done. It's, uh, that's a question that would have to go to your staff, Steve. Right, and I know Becky's working on it. Becky's already started this conversation, so about how can we, you know, fit? Um, it's, a, it's something we have to wait and then, uh, you know, figure out how to do it. Um, but I appreciate, I, I, I appreciate this sense of urgency. And, you know, if if the 8.2 is or is a, a substantive fix is off the table, we got to go to Plan B. I mean, we put all this energy into trying, you know, at this at this decision making time. And I guess I'm I'm only offering that it sounds like it's it's not a Plan A. Um, I could be wrong, only one member. No, no, it doesn't yeah. seem to fit into. It hasn't been something that we've been talking a lot about. And, and, and we haven't had this this board discussion yet, and we will, I, I think, on the either next week or on the third. But um, but you know whether whether there's an uh, optional bond question or an optional project question on the uh, on the warrant, you know that uh, that might you know might be that, but it may not be Plan A. Okay. Awesome. You guys all sit down there for so the next any, any further back we need to go? Yeah, any further down there? <laughs> no, back up to the, uh, the approval of minutes. I get some. <laughs> um, a little funky um, coming around is uh, the first draft and it's draft of the 1920 hour. Um, so this is an interesting calendar year. We always like instant uh, interesting calendar year. What makes this one interesting? You can't see. I'm going to pull it up one by one. So um, the couple things that make it interesting. It's the first time you're going to see uh, Indigenous People Day instead of Columbus Day. So uh, we can support the town that piece. Um, a couple of tidbits. Uh, Labor Day is uh, September 2nd. Uh, that is the second earliest it can be. And at the time, one of the exciting factors, and you know, the Save Our Summer program was starting after Labor Day. So that is something this year. For example, it, we've talked about this as leadership, and I've been here for a few cycles. If Labor Day is like September 6th or 7th, it is very difficult to start after Labor Day because it just pushes everything out. But in full transparency, a one or two, it is possible. So that's a decision that the board can make. Um, this calendar does not start um, after Labor Day. Um, this calendar, for the first time, implements in a while. Well, actually, the first time mandatory implements an academy model, which we'd have four professional learning days in the week of uh, the 19th. New staff would be August 19th. And then we have four uh, professional learning days. Um, that have, having staff come in that week, uh, we've tried to foreshadow this academy as much as we can. We know that any change like this, when for the last years they started the 26th to move back in, there will be some change in schedules and some great excitement and some less than that. <laughs> um, so that is a change. So we have the first day of students on the 26th. They get four days in before uh, Labor, uh, Labor Day, and we have 30. That Friday is a no PD, no school day. 
Um, we have a, a PD day the 13th. It, it typically is a collaboration day where we get together and talk about kids. Um, it may, <coughs> we're going to give the, the buildings a little bit more flexibility on that day to make sure it's a day that meets their needs. If we go to October, <coughs> this is um, where we are is uh, October 14th is a, a day off. Um, parent teacher conference uh, the seventh the, the seventh this day would be an 11 to 7 at night day and then the middle school would be the eighth uh, middle school because of the hundred kids and everyone to meet we can do a double day that's why the collective bargaining the agreement we have veterans on the 11th and we have veterans uh, especially the 11th and we have um, Thanksgiving this is also what makes this year interesting is the winter holiday, the, the Christmas New Year's is on a Wednesday. Once every seven years, it is conceivable to do the two week vacation. Uh, we have done the two week vacation, uh, not always, um, but we have done it, I think, in my 20 years here twice. Once when my daughter was born, she was born November 11th, I had two weeks in December. I was very appreciative of the public school board for that two weeks. And so was my wife. I'll never forget you for that. I was a principal back then advocating strongly for the two weeks. Um, we do, there is, it is not just the Hopkinton School District calendar. If we um, try to look regionally, we are connected, and Steve Rothenberg was here tonight, yep. he was the director of the Concord Regional Technical Center. We try to align with Concord substantively because we try to prevent, uh, you know, provide less friction for those 30 kids, or 20 or 30 kids that go, and having a different calendar is more friction for them. We try to support that program, and it's uh, certainly a value to us. Um, this year, Concord and the both school districts, no one jumped to the two week. And frankly, it would have been easier if everybody did because you aligned. But to full transparency, they didn't jump to the two week. So we would come back on the second to um, so come back for two days. These would be the two days if you did the two week. And then and typically, you don't come back one day the day before the eve. You typically. So it's pretty standard the week before. Do you want to come back on the second for two days? That is uh, up to the board. One of the reasons, and we can ask for feedback if you want, but, but our experience in getting feedback from the community is it is, is typically uh, two polls. These are, uh, you will see some love the two weeks, some not. You will see love starting before Labor Day, some not. You will see, so we're happy to do whatever you want, but I, I usually get passion plea on both sides, and then I get a second email saying, how come we didn't listen to you? But I'm happy to serve at the pleasure of the board. Um, there's the April week. The last week it goes into May. We have, oh, I missed some February. Oh, February, there is something here worth noting. Um, and I really appreciate, um, and I've been in Chris's shoes for a little while. Um, national elections, big elections, having the day off is a better day. Uh, it just is a better day. Um, we haven't always had the primary day off, and then there is, and there is no firm commitment that it is February 11th. I think the statute says no later than February 11th. So if, California moves to the 11th, we'll be, you know what I mean? I think we kind of race to be early there, so this would be a flex day when I get this out to the community. If it stays the 11th, but it's conceivable, it could be in January, you know what I'm saying? But I think the better wisdom is to probably, for this primary, is to have the day as a, as a PD day. Um, and, and just, I know from my experience and Chris's experience, I think we share this and Rebecca's, it's a, it's a better day. And I think for the town, it's yeah. better to have the kids out and be able to conduct elections too. So I uh, appreciate that. In local elections in March, you seem to be okay. You agree with that? Yeah. But for the Big East, you're this important thing. Yeah. So um, that's the first time since I presented a calendar that a primary day um, has been on the calendar. I think. Bill, go and check in. Thank you, right. March. Um, you know what's unusual about March? Okay. Days off. No days off. Very unusual in our little world. So we're going uh, March, and April, and then we have the five days into May. So here's where it gets um, funky. And this is the decision, again, this is not an action item tonight, this is for your um, reflection. Now we have, uh, we have 177 days in the Hopkins School District, that is allowed by uh, statute. We, it's considered we go by hours. Our school day eight to three, or eight to 10 of three, quarter of three is considered a long school day in New Hampshire. Um, so we have more than enough hours to go 177 days. Where this came from is years ago we had six half days. And so when we had 180 but six half days, um, the feedback from the community, from the staff, almost, I liked them, but not many people like half days. 
Um, so we eliminated uh, those six three-hour PD blocks is 18 hours. We decided to do three six-hour PD blocks um, and get the same 18 hours. So that's where it came from. That's where the 177 days came from. Concord School District has 177 days. Bo has 180, but multiple early release days. But the hours were all pretty close to the same hours. Um, so if we start on the 26th and we don't have the two weeks, the last day of school, P through 12, the 177th day, and even though Donna and I counted this 87 times today, it's possible that we're off, um, for elementary would be 10, June 10, secondary June 11, um, people ask, I've been superintendent 10 years. We have never had a year without a snowman. Um, for a couple years, we had three. The uh, last two years, we've had seven. Um, the state requires that we put five in the calendar. Um, this, this year, um, many districts have had three snow days already. The Hopkins School District has not yet pulled the trigger. Congratulations. Well, <laughs> not unlike the calendar, I get emails both ways. Steve, thank you for going to school today, and Steve, you aren't the nicest one. So that's a 50-50. Um, the five days would make it the 17th and 18th. Um, so if the board wanted to uh, extend the two week, I believe there are some administrators that would be very appreciative of that once in seven years stars aligning. Um, but I also, and I don't know, I, we, we had an extensive discussion as a leadership about the burden that places on families, a two-week vacation and how much time. It's absolutely real. So, um, but that would just slide it two days. If you wanted to start after Labor Day, those four days would bump us very late. What we try to do, I would, I would prefer not to go any later than the 19th. In the last few years, we've ended on the Friday in the 21, 22s. Could I sleep well at night saying we could go all the way to the 22nd? We could. Bringing everybody back for that, 20, you know, that day on a Monday is kind of funky. Uh, we do know that seniors and we do know that commitments outside of school start typically the 22nd. We've been pretty good about no later date families planning things on the 22nd, you know, through the 19th. Um, so, through to go, in the old days, we had an extensive calendar committee. This year, this calendar was driven by the district's professional learning. Um, committee because the placement in moving to an academy model was the priority. The academy model, so on the 19th is new staff orientation, the 20th is welcome back. The tradition there is the superintendent tries to give a passionate, inspiring speech, and then the buildings have the rest of the time. The next three days are taking a look at, remember, we're really trying to increase and um, implement a uh, a, a curriculum management tool. So one of those days would be working with staff in the curriculum management tool. One of the days would be building base to make sure they can start the year off with their goals. And the others is we have a tremendous amount of mandatory training, including bloodborne path, blood pathogens, including um, bullying, and including harassment. Um, so trying to concentrate on some of that. There also would be a strand where we would have um, Mindfulness, we would have universal design for learning, we would have uh, trauma-based practices, crisis prevention intervention, understanding by design, all the things I've talked about would have a strand for people to take. So though that academy model would start off with um, some high quality professional learning in a concentrated way. Um, so that is the presentation of the draft, the decisions or feedback this is the recommended calendar, but it is not one that um, I am married to. I would say that we're engaged more than dating, um, but not married. But feel that this is what's best for kids, but understand that there are community inputs on the Labor Day stuff, the two week stuff, all that stuff. Is that fair, leadership team, that I Good job. preface that? Next week it will be an action item. As I said in board's notes, uh, the collective bargaining, teachers collective bargaining was requires it to be approved by the last meeting in December. So in order for me to meet that need, I will need this as an action item. Is there any homework you have for me regarding this calendar? 
No, but I have a question. Just quickly for Dave, because I haven't looked. Where does the state stand on the whole Labor Day school start thing? Is that still very much? Yeah, so that. that floating? Yeah, I think the governor's still going to be pushing that. But, um, but it wouldn't be effective next year. No, 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 no. And, and, uh, and th th there'll be. We'll, we'll have to see where it goes. I mean, there, there may be some negotiating points on that. So, they did it in the state of Texas when we were down there. They, did, they, mandated, they mandated school start date, and they gave the districts basically three years of waivers. So because there's calendars set so far in advance, they gave the district, districts the option to, to, take, to apply for waivers. I think that's what was in the plan, is it would be implemented in a couple of years. Yeah, OK. Yeah. I figured they'd probably do something. Maybe if, they, if that goes through. Any homework to Steve? No, how quickly do you find out um, about things like, like NHIA schedules? Um, thank you. But we will, because I did communicate with Dan. Um, there, is, there are some questions about football, middle school, and high school sports. Sorry, because they're talking about moving them a week. So they have not that said um, it would be up to post school. So Dan could not, Dan couldn't definitively give those things. Uh, but as soon as I know, we. Our prior notice world of putting those on the dates has been appreciated by the community. Yes. So as soon as I get them, I will do that. Okay. Um, and I'm, I'm going to have to put a caveat about the primary day that this could be. Actually, you probably understand. We'll, we'll be on the front, whatever the primary day is. Okay. okay. Anything else for Steve and everybody's all set to review and provide mm -hmm. guidance next week? Excellent. Great. Good. Moving on. on to the personnel. Sure. Um, Last week, last week, Dean Blair, uh, Bank and Service Supervisor, was that last week? So uh, that opened, so Brian Ramirez went to Harold Bay, right? Yes. And that opened up a position for Gene Blair to go tonight, and which opened up a position for, very pleased, incredibly proud, and happily to bring Brandon Jaffe forward as a full-time custodian, uh, graduate of HS, uh, H, I almost said HSD, but that counts, uh, HHS. I had a chance to interview Brandon and how much he uh, appreciates the opportunity and likes to take care of the school to support the kids. Right. So very pleased to bring Brandon in for um, That's our custodian. Uh, about a month ago, I uh, made a request for us to take a look at, this goes along with our curriculum management tool, on uh, trying to provide some staffing once, uh, twice a month after school, some work individual times with teachers, a curriculum design specialist position, and a rubric on Atlas trainer. A math program is currently getting his PhD in curriculum design, is, uh, has, a, has applied to be the curriculum design specialist. And a rubric on Atlas, we have one person, Tara Short, if you remember, took a leave last year and stayed with us doing that. Um, we believe both of these positions will support teacher learning. The curriculum design is how to teach from a standard, how to unpack and create ICANN statements, how to utilize UBD principles um, within our standards-based approach. Our Rubicon is how do we develop units and how do we create more of a visible curriculum for second grade, third grade, and how do we access and share and integrate our curriculum through a wonderful tool. So these are stipendent positions that are within the budget. Tara gave a marvelous presentation last year on Rubicon, yeah. So these are uh, within our curriculum um, design funds. Okay. Any questions for Steve on those three action items? We both will make a presentation of board meeting. Great. Great. Excellent. All right, let's cool meetings. Hit number seven. Um, we're very pleased to bring a $2,000 donation from Microdac to support First World Pockets. Thanks to Phil Reader. Thanks yeah. to Phil Reader. Yeah. I, I think he's done yeah. this sometimes yeah. even more than once a year. Yeah. Uh, he's done this a lot. So uh, he's a passionate, or if he's, it's been awesome. All right, that covers all of the board business for this evening. Um, we re arrived at the second area for public comment. If um, those of you who are still awake out there, <laughs> eyes open, would like to share any comments with us, we'd be happy to hear them. Go ahead. I'll try and keep it brief. Um, I just have a little concern that in all the moving parts of the proposed budget for next year, because it's about a $2 million, $2.3 million, or $1 million swing, that um, I still haven't seen what's going into the building trust for next year and what the, the, what the actual plan is. And so I have to implore the board to really consider uh, that as we move forward, we give adequate funding 
uh, because your CIP shows big numbers. Um, and I, I was, I, I heard around 300,000 would be a good number from other project managers in town, but uh, it was, uh, just keep a close eye on that if you would, please. Um, to piggyback on um, Jim's comment about, um, and um, Mr. Houston's about the elevator, I forgot to mention that, that I feel that fixing that elevator is a need, not a want. Uh, I, I, it's embarrassing, it's rude. So um, it's 1.3 million, um, I've been over the plans a million times, it can be pulled out um, of the $8 million front entrance, there's no new building in it, and I believe Harriman confirmed that, that that 1.3 million, am I misspeaking here? I, I've never seen the, seen it broken out quite like that. Well, it was definitely broken out in a line item as 1.3 million uh, at the presentation, and I have the slide on it, um, and I've walked it myself, and there is no new construction. That, that, that back corridor is a part of the existing library. It whacks whack out the bathrooms. It's, it appears to me that it, it is all renovation. So you do lose a classroom. At the time we discussed this, and perhaps as principal we can speak to this, that losing one classroom was okay at the, for next year um, at the high school. That that wasn't going to be, because we're gonna gain four, but those were already occupied for uh, sixth grade. And so the discussion was that we could accommodate perhaps losing a classroom. No, our classroom utilization is going up because class our enrollment's going up. So losing a classroom would be detrimental to the middle school schedule. So it wouldn't happen. It'd be, it'd be too, it couldn't make it happen. No. Okay, so that's a huge issue. Okay, um, and then we went back um, when Harriman was here, and uh, one of the questions I had sent in was about moving. Um, do we look at a band aid on the front entrance of just? Um, adding a set of double airlock doors out the existing front entrance, put handicapped parking spaces out the front, and it was never really addressed because I think it wasn't understood. And so that was my original thought was, can, it, can we throw some double air do airlock doors on the, I mean the main offices, put where the bus loop goes, put eight, um, four to eight handicapped parking spaces. And this is too late to the show right now, I think, to be considered for next year, but it does seem to me like a, a fairly inexpensive mandate if we could piggyback off the 1.3 million of the um, elevator renovation, where you could have handicap accessibility right off the bus ramp through a, a newly reconstructed main office area over to the elevator and fix that whole solution, but we do lose a classroom. So that, that was my misunderstanding. I thought that we could accommodate this in the classroom. Uh, difficult. Okay. Um, so if there's any way for the board to consider that elevator renovation, that the classroom is conversion to Okay, thank you. Yeah. Just one more clarifying question. If you had the extra million dollars of the expenses of the Trevor Sheets, maybe we had that one million dollars of it by us, $15 million in bond, is that correct? Just so How much bond would you get you for the dollar payment? Right. That's what I think of my mind. That gives us a $15 million bond that we work on. So the million dollars wasn't for a payment. Yeah. The million dollars in Steve's budget was for the roofs and then the um, gym unit above the high school. Originally, it also included the day tank, I mean, the, the tank, but now that's out. Um, so it wasn't a, it wasn't earmarked as, not just that it can't be, but it just wasn't earmarked as I, I misunderstood yeah. it. I thought that's how it related to the reduction of take out a 15 million bond restricting all bonds. But a 14.3 million dollar bond is a dollar 64 on the tax. A dollar 64. The back gym. So that is true. For the back gym. Three agreements. Three thousand. And if they come into a teacher's session, they just go down. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Sure. Can you like come no, to the microphone, please? The current, the way it is currently. Yeah. Then the people at home are still awake and hear you. <laughs> uh, I, I, I want to thank you for all you're doing, uh, certainly on the town side, and how difficult it is to, you know, split up wants and needs and uh, try to meet what the budget committee would like. But I, I just wanted to get a couple of clarifications from Steve's presentation. Uh, I didn't understand on the. Uh, the staffing needs memorandum. There's the first section of second, third grade. On the first line, it says grade two, 64 students. On the second line, it says there are 82 students in second grade. Did you uh, clarify that? Sure. There. And so there are eight. There are 64 uh, kids going moving into second grade next year. 
there's 82 kids in second grade moving into third grade next year. So I apologize if I did not communicate that clearly. So uh, right now there's three thirds. With 82 kids in second, we need another third. There's 64 kids right now in second grade. And talking with Bill based on projections and where we are, there's another teacher from there. Okay. And the other question I have again is just from your comments about on the revenue side. You mentioned the federal program grant for 208,000. We were not getting that again because of reallocation. So what we wanted to speak to how you. So on the spreadsheet that was handed out last week that talked about the expenses, you'll see that the expense side was shifted for food service, federal projects, and fund other grants. It's called other grants fund. That same amount is being budgeted next year. It's just being done differently. So for instance, we need more in the food service area because we are at our capacity with the expense line, meaning that we went over last year what we actually budgeted for food service. Once you count in, um, it's kind of a technical thing, but we have to put in the value of USDA commodities that we actually don't spend the money that we get, but we have to put in the, it as a revenue and expense for the value that we receive. So we have to build a new food service amount that's gonna last us years. And I didn't wanna increase food service and then not decrease other things. And if you look at the federal projects area in that budget, you'll see that we've never met at where it was at 750. So all I did is reallocate that. So if you add up all the food service revenues on the sheet that Steve gave you, the difference is gonna be to what is in the budget, $50,000. That's because in the budget right now is that the district is going to absorb 50,000 of the operating transfer. Um, so it's really just, re it's not, it's not, it's really, we had a, we have to have a budget amount and, and a revenue amount, right? And so I didn't want to spike up the food service when I could actually tone down the um, federal projects. And actually, if you look at the other funds, the grant funds, that's been spending more than 38795 for years. So I put that to 50, which is something more reasonable to what we've been looking at in the past. So if you, again, if you add up all the revenues for all those funds, the only difference between the two, like in prior years, is just the $50,000 transfer to help with the food service. <coughs> and then would the expenses be going down by? No, because it's, again, it's the same expenses, and it's the same revenue, except for there's just a $50,000 difference, because right now, now it could be on a tier. Steve could put 49999 because last year we only had a dollar. Normally, which has been done many, many Normally we minutes. budget just the dollars, yeah, so now exactly. we're budgeting what's more close to accurate <laughs> on that. And just so that the revenue doesn't change, she's, she's, Michelle has taken it out of the, um, federal, the, federal, the federal projects, yeah, right. just, which is a wash anyway a between, wash. between expense and revenue, projected expense, projected revenue. Okay. Thank you for the yeah. clarification. Anything else at, uh, at this juncture? If not, we'll move ahead to action items. Uh, we'll go right to action item number 13. Um, I'll take a motion for the Hopkins School Board to approve the superintendent's nomination of Brandon Jaff Jaffe? Jaffe. Jaffe, custodian, Hoppington Middle and High Schools. Start to be determined by the superintendent of schools pending final approval of the superintendent of schools. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed, motion carries. Take a motion for the Hopkinton School Board to approve the superintendent's nomination of Matt Krogman, curriculum design specialist for the 2018-19 school year. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed, motion carries. Take a motion for the Hopkinton School Board to approve the superintendent's nomination of Tara Short, Rubicon Atlas trainer, 2018-19 school year. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed, motion carries. Take a motion for the Hopkins School Board to accept the superintendent's recommendation to award the 2019 to 2022 Hopkins School District transportation contract to first student. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Thank you for all your analysis on that too. That's a lot of work. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Take a motion for the Hopkins School Board to accept the superintendent's recommendation to award the contract to repair the HMHS underground storage mm -hmm. tank 
oil to lakes region environmental in the amount not to exceed thirteen thousand dollars for cathodic protection and spill bucket replacement. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Take a motion for the Hopkins School Board to accept the superintendent's recommendation to withdraw not more than thirteen thousand dollars from the school building repair and maintenance trust to repair the HMHS underground storage tank for cathodic protection and spill bucket replacement. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Yeah, uh, just just when we noticed the public hearing, we noticed it for ten thousand dollars. And Steve, you said we can notice it for a certain a dollar amount, and then I think so because when I talked to Neil, our, our, our posting requirements only the date and time, but everything else we do is beyond the requirements. Okay, so it's the requirements are stayed in time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and you did mention it during the um, during the no, public he did. hearing. Yeah. Just, well, so. just one, yeah. I just wanted to clarify yeah. that. And, but if it's up to, if it was like me to get an attorney. Um, declaration and then we can hold to it. I mean, all you're doing is up to, it doesn't mean we spend it. I'm good with the up to. Yeah, okay. yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's not, not more than. Yeah. 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 yeah, or not more than. It's yeah, not more yeah, than. Yeah. It's not, not more than. It's Sorry. Yeah. And I, yeah. I do believe the posting requirement is Okay. That's great. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed motion carries. Take a motion for the Hopkins School Board to approve the superintendent's recommendation to accept a donation in the amount of $2,000 from microdacons.com in support of the HMHS robotics. So moved. Second. And many thanks to uh, MicroDeck for their continued support. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed motion carries? And do we have a need for a non-public session, Steve? It's up to you. It's not, uh, nothing tonight is time sensitive. If you want to call it, we should call me. Yeah. Public? Yep, I think we should. Yeah, yep. we're do it. Okay. Um, I'll take a motion for a non-public session for the discussion of matters as for RSA 91-8, colon 3, Roman numeral 2, lower letter A, lower lowercase a, b, c, and I, L. L, thank you. I have to know my upper and lower case letters. Well, which one are we going? Are we going into for a legal issue? Uh, we're going to, uh, well, personnel negotiations. Do, do you have any, we did yes negotiations, okay. yes legal. Do you have any personnel issues? No. Okay. okay, so just, so just make sure we just, and there, yeah. there will be no action out of this. Yeah, we should have negotiations. Yeah, I think we should. That's why yeah. I think we should. Yeah. Okay. Thanks All in favor? Yes. Jim? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And yes, thank you. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thanks, Jay. Seven fifty-nine. Thank you, Jay. Steve, you need us to stay. Thank you, Amy. I'll be right back. Thanks for the candy last night. <laughs> oh yeah, anytime. <laughs> oh yeah. We know where we keep it. We know where it is now. Right now. Well, I don't know where it is. Game over. Once you know where it is.